the uh, basic uh, topics that we're going to be covering today, we're going to start with uh, a better understanding of cable construction. I have found over the years, uh, you know, doing cable related training classes, whether it's diagnostic testing or cable fault locating, um, a lot of people just kind of take cables for granted and kind of minimize uh, the complexities associated with them. Uh, you know, it's just a cable, right? It just connects two points together. Um, well, we're going to take a little bit of time today. Like I said, we're going to start off with the cable construction. What are the different components? What are their uh, functions? How do they contribute possibly to the deterioration of the cable if uh, they're not, you know, set in properly uh, or during splices if we, uh, you know, don't join the cables together properly? So once we better understand uh, the different uh, construction and properties of the cable, we will go in then and start talking about typical aging characteristics and deterioration. What leads to the faults that inevitably we go out then and locate? Because uh, again, the more we understand on this, the more value we can be to our clients because even if we do do a fault locate for them, all right, that's value one. We get them back up and running. Value two, is to be able to consult with them and have them better understand what led to that fault in the first place and are there corrective actions that they might be able to uh, take advantage of that would prevent a second, third, or fourth fault from occurring. So we will look at cable construction, deterioration, uh, and aging. Then we will go into uh, the cable fault locating techniques, methodologies, uh, and we will talk not just medium voltage cable, but we will talk also low voltage cable. Uh, this would basically be your less than 1000 volt uh, uh, cable structures. So we're going to talk cable fault locating everything from uh, low voltage signal and control cables, telecommunication wiring, all the way up through medium voltage and in all fairness, a lot of these techniques can also be adopted to high voltage and extra high voltage cables as well. Um, and once we go ahead and uh, learn what the different techniques and methodologies are, uh, one of the analogies I'm going to be using in the presentation is the old uh, golf bag uh, analogy. Once we learn what the function of the different clubs are and why you would reach for a five iron versus a nine iron, uh, or why you would select, let's say, arc reflection versus impulse current reflection technique. Um, once we understand how the tools work, we will then talk a little bit about how do we now organize a strategy. When we show up on the job site, or even better, before we leave for the job site, what are the things that we should be checking off on our list to make sure that we are properly prepared with the right strategy and the right tools when we show up at the job? Um, and then uh, to close out the presentation today, uh, we will also be talking about what I call cable fault profiles. After we've tested the cable, the thing we have to remember is cable faults are a random act. They are not designed or set to parameters, okay? So in the most technical sense, cable faults no matter how long you're in this industry, no matter how many cable faults you go out on, in the most technical sense, you will never, ever, ever have the same experience twice. All cable faults are unique. They are not designed. They are not set to engineering parameters. They are random acts that occur in the cable structure. So in the most technical sense, they are all unique. However, they do follow certain profiles. Uh, a blowout fault, cable severs apart, a dead short conductor and uh, shield become bonded together through some fault mechanism. Pinhole faults, they may range in impedance value, how much insulation resistance is left. Uh, so there will be variables, but typical profile categories, uh, and that's what the closing session of the uh, of the class is going to be today is learning how to profile. So again, we know what is going to be the best pre-locating technique. 
what is going to be the best uh, pinpointing technique. Uh, and we will also talk about the deployment. Is it in conduit? Is it direct buried in the ground? Because again, that will dictate our overall strategy. Do I need to do it an exact pinpoint or do I only need to sectionalize? So all of this will be covered. All right, looks like we are sitting at about 14 attendees. Um, we're coming up on 10 after the hour. I'm going to go ahead, just queue up the first uh, PowerPoint. And Kristen, if there's no objection, I guess I'm just going to get rolling. We good to roll? Yep, sounds good, Tom. All right. I'll tell you what, I'm going to turn my camcorder off so we can go ahead and maximize the screen with the PowerPoint. I will pop back on camera if I need to uh, kind of build upon a certain uh, point in the lesson. But for right now, we'll just maximize the screen with the PowerPoint. And again, our first module is going to be uh, medium voltage cable construction. Now, although the cable construction can vary, I mean, here I show a single conductor uh, cable where, I mean, you could have tricore cables, uh, armor uh, cables, uh, submarine-based cables, where there may be more entities uh, within the cable structure. But in the most generic sense, a medium voltage cable is going to have six fundamental layers that are associated with it. The first is going to be the conductor. Bonded to and surrounding the conductor is going to be a semiconductive layer called the conductor shield. We then have our insulation or more proper term, our dielectric material. Now this can be an extruded dielectric such as cross-link polyethylene, um, high molecular weight polyethylene, tree retardant uh, cross-link polyethylene. Uh, it could be a copolymer substance like ethylene propylene rubber or it could be uh, a laminated structure such as oil pregnated lead covered cable. Now, directly uh, bonded to and uh, protecting the insulation or the dielectric is again another semiconductive layer called the insulation shield. We then have our metallic shield and thank goodness in the mid 1970s, early 1980s, Somebody had the great idea that says, let's put a jacket on these cables and let's protect that metallic shield. Those of you that are uh, in the class that might have gray in your uh, hair uh, and remember back to the early 70s and even a little bit into the early 90s, a lot of the underground distribution cables that were first launched into the marketplace were unjacketed cables. My personal uh, opinion on them, I always call them the what in God's name were you thinking cable. You have a copper shield on this thing and you're going to directly bury it, throw it into the ground. What do you think happened to those metallic shields after the first several years of deployment? Well, those of you that are sitting there going saying, well, they probably corroded and fell apart. You would be correct. So. In the late uh, part of the 1980s, rolling into the uh, 1990s, brighter heads prevailed and we started jacketing the cable in order to help protect the metallic members and also help protect uh, the cable from having water ingress or water permeation into the cabling uh, layers. All right, the conductor, it's pretty obvious. Uh, the conductor is the current carrying component, one of the most important parts of the cable. It takes the current from point A to point B. It can be either copper or aluminum. Uh, and obviously, there's going to be pros and cons to both of the materials. Obviously, aluminum is going to be lighter. Uh, copper is going to be heavier, but copper is going to have better uh, ampacity capabilities per diameter. Uh, as opposed to aluminum. Now, one of the items that whenever we are looking at the conductor, okay, and how it can translate into cable faults is when we are doing our splicing of a cable, 
we need to know whether we're dealing with aluminum or whether we're de dealing with copper. Uh, and particularly, pay very close attention to your splice kits. They will de define uh, what your cutbacks and everything are going to be if you're dealing with aluminum, because you got to allow for a stretch factor versus copper. They'll also go ahead and state what die sets you're going to need. Um, and again, you might need an aluminum die set if you're using aluminum conductors versus copper. Probably um, one of the biggest failure mechanisms in splices, uh, premature failures in splices, comes down to using the wrong die sets. And what happens is you over compress or over crimp on the aluminum. That, in essence, creates a hot spot when the cable is energized and under load, and the cable splice prematurely degradates and fails due to thermal degradation or this hot spot that we created. On the other end of that, if we don't overcompress it, we might undercompress, which, again, now we don't have a good bond connection, a good tight connection, and once again, we create a hot spot, thermal degradation, premature failure of the splice. So again, understanding the material of the conductor, following the directions in the splice kit, and the ever important, using the right die set. And if it tells you to use three crimps and rotate at 90 degree angles, follow those directions. More crimps does not make it better it makes it worse. The more crimps you put in, the more compressed you're making it, you're creating hot spots and premature cable failures. Follow the instructions. Okay, there are also different uh, styles of conductors as well. We have obviously what is known as the solid. Now, we normally only see this in very low voltage uh, um, signal and control uh, type wires, uh, telecommunication wires, etc. We have these stranded uh, conductors. They can be either compact, uh, which is very attractive. Again, if uh, you know diameter of the cable is a major concern um, and you want to be able to put many conductors in a small location, like in an industrial plants, uh, typical choice there is to go to the compacted uh, conductors, the compressed conductors, and the concentric conductors. Each will have certain pros and cons in their design as far as their opacity handling capability per geographic uh, cross-sectional area. You also have segmented conductors, which we'll talk about what value these have when we talk a little bit about this thing called the skin effect. Um, there is a reason why we would use a segmented design, which nicely leads us into the skin effect. The skin effect is the tendency for current to flow mostly near the outer surface of an electrical conductor, and its uh, um, effect becomes more apparent as you enter the realm of alternating current, and more importantly, as you go up in frequency of alternating current. As we can see here at DC, the current density is spread uh, uniformly throughout the conductor. At low frequency, 50, 60 hertz and power frequencies, the conductor is mostly used, but now the current is tending to favor toward the outer uh, um, edges of the conductor. And the center of the conductor is not really utilized. Now, as you move up in frequency, you start getting into several hundred hertz, and particularly when you start getting into the kilohertz, megahertz uh, areas, we really see the uh, skin effect really affecting uh, um, the uh, current density in this situation, where at certain frequencies, uh, really the conductor is being very, very poorly utilized as far as current handling capability, and everything is traveling on the outer skin of the conductor. Now, you get up into the gigahertz area and so forth, and now we actually use things called waveguides. I mean, literally, it's just like a metallic tube. doesn't even have a center in it. It's like a, a hollowed-out center because all of the current travels on the skin 
at these extra high frequencies. Now, in order to mitigate the skin effect, a segmented conductor can be used where each sector is insulated and current flows around each sector. So again, if maximizing the opacity handling capability of the cable is the engineer's desire uh, when specking out and designing the system, they may select a segmented where even though we are pulling skin effect on each of the segments, we get better uh, distribution and better current handling capability of the conductors. Now, another technique that is used is insulating each of the strands within the stranded conductor. This will also help uh, control because in essence, now it's just like having hundreds of tiny conductors making up the total conductor. And we would get better utilization on each of the cable strands. But to do that, we would literally, the manufacturing process and the cost goes up because we have to insulate each and every strand within the conductor. Now, as mentioned, the conductor can be made of one solid core or of multiple strands that form a stranded conductor or segmented conductor. Either way, the conductor size is typically uh, referenced in terms of its cross-sectional area. A smaller diameter is referred uh, or referenced using the American wire gauge. For instance, a cable may have a conductor size of one aught or four aught, which is a size from the American wire gauge. After four aught, the conductor cross-sectional area is re uh, referenced either using the unit of KC mil or MCM, or possibly millimeters squared. KC mil is the American standard unit measured in circular mills, where a circular mill is the size of a circle's area with a diameter of one mil or a thousandth of an inch. MCM is the same thing as KC mil. The international standard tends to use metric units like millimeters. Now, there is a conversion factor going from KC mil to millimeters squared. So please note that a 1,000 KC mil and a 1,000 millimeters squared are not the same size. All right, let's talk a little bit about ampacity. Overall, the conductor is sized to carry the appropriate amount of current for the circuit, which is also called its impacity, as well as to handle uh, the short circuit currents that may occur during a fault event. The impacity is uh, affected by the conductor material, size and style, various uh, thermal related issues, and even the style of grounding will all affect the current carrying capability of the circuit. The conductor, as discussed, has the, a uh, particular DC resistance depending on the material chosen and the cross-sectional area of the conductor. These aspects also affect how much current can flow, uh, which is the main purpose of the conductor, obviously. Typically, the larger the conductor, the larger the amount of current that can then pass through it. Aside from the conductor side size, though, there are thermal related issues that affect the ampacity and ultimately the conductor size, uh, etc. Load cycling on the circuit will definitely affect the uh, current carrying capability. Again, when you think of load cycling, Traditionally, when we used to do load cycling and size out conductors uh, for underground distribution and residential distribution, the formulas uh, that we would use took into consideration cooling periods. And think about your local neighborhoods and so forth in like an underground residential distribution. There are times of the day where you peak uh, and you are carrying the highest loads. There are other times during the day or in the evenings where the loads drop and the cable has cooling down periods. So in load cycling, this is typically taking into consideration into the overall design of the circuit. Well, 
where this model uh, kind of falls apart in some of the early years of uh, um, wind energy, the engineers that were specking out the cables were using the same formulas and number crunching that they were using for underground distribution. And one of the learning curves was in wind energy, if the wind is blowing, nobody's throttling back. It's harvest season, right? You know, the utility is making money. They're generating. So with the wind is blowing, they don't throttle back. That circuit is carrying full load. Now, if that wind is blowing consistently for weeks on end, that circuit is taking full load current with no cool down period for long extended periods of time. That led to a lot of premature cable failures in the early uh, um, deployments of wind farms. Once the problem was learned, okay, engineering kind of stepped in and they stepped up and spec'd higher uh, um, ampacity handling capabilities of the cabling systems in order to take into consideration that they would not have the same load cycling or cooling periods as in normal distribution. Now, thermal resistivity of the cable and its environment is also a very important consideration. Here we kind of show buried cables in the ground. Now, if they're carrying full load, each conductor is heating. In a flat lay formation like we see on the screen, the conductors don't necessarily contribute to the heating of one another. Now, when we look at trifoil uh, configurations in a moment where the cables are kind of stacked in a pyramid, now each conductor and the heat that is producing is affecting the other conductors. Also, the thermal resistivity of the earth or the ground is very important. How well does it dissipate this heat and take it away from the conductors? Now, if you really want to know more about the effects of thermal resistivity, We'll make sure that uh, we post in the uh, chat or in the questions the web link to uh, Protex uh, video library. But every month we do a webinar called the Third Thursday Webinar. Um, going back in uh, to the January of this year, investigation of cable failures at wind farms. If you are interested in the effects of thermal resistivity and how it can prematurely fail a cable uh, or cable splice. There was a lot of actual research and evidence done in this webinar that we shared. Uh, so again, we'll make sure that that link is brought into the chat or brought into the, uh, the questions pane if you are interested in watching some of these uh, past webinars that we have done. Okay, and I mentioned also the lay of the cable also is very important. In a trifoil, we really need to make sure that we've got very good thermal resistivity of the earth because here the cables interact with one another, heating one another. We've got to make sure that that heat dissipates away. Otherwise, as we're going to learn when we talk about uh, or cable degradation, we're going to start to thermally degradate uh, the dielectric and that, again, can be a source of future uh, cable failure. Now, due to the laws of induction, a voltage is induced on the shield. So the grounding style is also a factor that's going to affect the impacity of the circuit and the sizing of the cable. If a cable has uh, only one end grounded, then this will not derate the cable because there is going to be no pathway now for a circulating current on the shield. So advantage of a single end bonding would be no circulating current and we can really boost and maximize the ampacity handling of the circuit. Now, if the cable is multi-point bonded, for instance, as we see here, bonded at both ends, through the induction, this is going to go ahead and cause a circulating current on the sheaths, which will again then down uh, the ampacity handling of the circuit. And then there's also a technique called cross bonding, which we're going to learn, which gives us the benefits of a 
single end bonding, uh, but without the dangers of single end bonding as we extend longer in cable lengths. And I'll explain that in the up and coming slides here. Now, the biggest issue with the single end bonding is you are going to be limited to cable length because as you move away from the bond point, as you move down the cable, you now begin to build a voltage potential between the conductor and the shield. Therefore, the IEEE is going to limit the amount of length that you can go out uh, to where this potential would be considered too high or dangerous. So when we talk about single bonding, single point bonding, we may find these with some of our industrial uh, clients, um, but typically this is reserved to only a few hundred feet of cable, short cable runs. But it does maximize uh, the uh, current handling capability of the conductor because there are no circulating currents in this condition. Now, a system is multipoint uh, bonded uh, or both end bonded if the cable sheets provide a circulating current under normal conditions. This will cause losses in the screen, which reduce the current carrying capacity of the conductors. Their losses will be smaller uh, for cables in a trifoil uh, formation than those in a flat formation. So again, controlling the circulating currents the engineer will take into consideration uh, in the design, should we go with a trifoil design in order to uh, help control these losses. But if I go to a trifoil design, now I really got to put a lot of focus on the uh, thermal resistivity of the surrounding earth to make sure that we dissipate the anticipated heats properly, so on and so forth. So you can see there is a lot that goes into just the design of a cabling system for maximum efficiency. All right, now in this next one, if the sheaths of uh, three single core cables are not bonded electrically together, induction between conductors and each sheath can produce unacceptable voltages between the sheaths, as we mentioned. On the other hand, bonding at both ends will result in sheath currents flowing with associated losses, which is again, not ideal or necessarily acceptable, especially for very long cable routes. This thing called cross bonding of single core cable sheaths is a technique which has been common in different countries for many, many years. It has been introduced uh, in order to avoid circulating currents and excessive sheath voltages, hence increase the current carrying capabilities. Now, it is achieved by dividing the cable route into three equal sections or six or nine uh, equal sections, depending upon the length, overall length of the cable. And the sheath continuity is then broken at each joint within that section. This, uh, the induced uh, sheath voltage in each section of uh, each phase are equal in magnitude and 180 degrees out of phase with one another. So in essence, when the sheaths are cross uh, connected, each sheath uh, circuit contains one sector from each uh, phase such that the total voltage in each sheath uh, circuit will sum out to zero as we show here. So this basically gives us the benefits of a single end bonding without the dangerous uh, voltage potential rises. Uh, it gives us the benefits of the dual end bondings, but by doing the cross bonding, we and everything being rotated by one ton 20 degrees, we cancel out the effects and we are able in, to maximize the current handling capability of the circuit. Now, cross bonding, where you will most typically see this is going to be in the wind energy. Again, it is normally uh, a strategy used for excessively long cables. So where you may run across this is going to be wind energy, the collector feeder cables. Now, 
where I've seen it used typically is when the collector feeder reaches about 10 miles in length or greater. Most of the wind farms in the U.S. that I've been to, if they are under 10 miles, normally I have seen that the traditional multi-point grounding seems to be the path taken. However, on a couple of the feeders that were in excess of 10 miles, I have seen cross bonding utilized. Now, this will affect your abilities of, of cable fault locating. Each of these sections are going to be equal in length, so they could be a few miles in length in each of these sections. When we do this cross bond and we separate the shields in the manner shown here, there are fault locating techniques called time domain reflectometry. Also, if you're doing partial discharge studies on cables, again, this technique also relies on this thing called time domain reflectometry. In a cross-sectioned uh, cable, the time domain reflectometry signals will stop at each cross bond. In essence, you know, you would only be able to test one section at a time. Now, if the cross bonds are brought above ground in a junction box, one of the strategies is def uh, to um, basically defeat the cross bonding by placing jumpers across and basically just continuing the shield of A onto the shield of A, put a jumper across and continue the shield of B over to B and so forth. So if the cross bonds are brought to the surface in a junction box, they can be defeated, which would then allow full coverage of the entire cable run um, and the time domain reflectometry technique in order to map the entire circuit beyond the cross bonds. But we'll talk a little bit more about that in the fault locating section as well. <clears throat> okay, to summarize, ultimately there are many aspects considered when the uh, conductor is selected, uh, such as uh, for the current carrying capabilities, uh, the flexibility, uh, cross-sectional area, cost, many considerations go into place. The diameter of the conductor may be uh, an issue, and that may be, again, a reason why we select segmented conductors um, or compressed conductors, et cetera. The flexibility, weight, their abilities to handle uh, um, current carrying uh, and higher temperatures. Sometimes multipoint grounding uh, may have to be used, which affects the uh, conductor diameter, because again, if we're using multipoint uh, um, grounding, that is going to lower the opacity handling capabilities of the conductor, so we might need to step up in gauge size to compensate. Each type and style of conductor has its own pros and cons. Because there are several factors uh, that go into selecting it, um, there are many types and styles of conductors as we had seen. All right, moving off of the conductor, let's talk a little bit about the uh, semiconductive uh, layer that's bonded to the conductor, uh, the conductor shield. The conductor shield helps keep the conductor round. Okay, basically, um, in a concentric uh, or stranded uh, conductor like we see here, you're going to have little gaps and voids. Now, gaps and voids, if there is a difference of potential, that will be an area where the dielectric strength within the void is weaker than the surrounding material and would be an area where partial discharge would find a home and would begin to form. In order to prevent this, the semiconductive uh, sheath protection or semiconductive uh, layer that is bonded to the conductor basically fills all the voids making sure that the conductor electrically is seen as being round with no voids in it. Because the conductor strands have burrs or protrusions the semiconductive layer also creates a barrier between the sharp edges and prevents stress concentration that could create small arcs or partial discharge activity into the dielectric, which over time would obviously lead to a cable failure. The conductor shield is at the same potential as the conductor, 
So there is no electrical uh, difference of potential. We kind of have an equipotential zone created around the conductor now. Also, the conductor shield is smooth, so there are no concentrated areas of stress on the conductor shield and insulation interface. Again, if there was not smooth and there were protrusions or anything going into the dielectric, these would be high stress areas and would, in essence, lead to cable breakdown and failure. Now, the next layer is going to be the dielectric, or we just simply call it the insulation layer. The insulation is designed, obviously, to withstand the electrical stress, which is the voltage over a unit of insulation. There are many types of insulation, and it comes in various types and also color formations or variations. Insulation is referred to as a dielectric, which just means that this insulation is for insulating electrical stress rather than uh, um, thermal insulators or uh, or being as like electrical standoffs. Because the insulation is used to resist voltage stress, calculations are made to apply the correct thickness. According to standards, the insulation must be able to withstand a higher voltage on the conductor shield insulation interface and the lower voltage stress at the insulation, uh, insulation shield interface. As implied, there is a voltage gradient that is going to be across the insulation. The calculation for insulation thickness is not a linear function, and the amount of stress, depending on the location, is calculated based on a log scale. The average electrical stress, which can be measured in volts per mil, is the cal excuse me, is the calculated by dividing what we call U naught or operating voltage phase to ground. That is what U naught represents operating voltage phase to ground. So by dividing the U naught by the uh, radius minus the inner radius, that is how we would then calculate uh, the mill size. The insulation is designed to handle the operating voltage, transient voltage spikes, and the bulk insulate, uh, um, bulk impulse level uh, for certain amount of time periods. All right. When you are doing cutbacks on the insulation, possibly getting ready to do cable terms or uh, cable splicing, you've got to be very careful not to leave gouges uh, or cuts in the dielectric. These are going to uh, basically be areas of high electrical stress. Uh, treeing activity will begin to form off of these uh, locations and eventual cable failure will occur. Many times there is a reference uh, to what percent insulation level is, and this will appear on the jacket of the cable. In a lot of our uh, cabled uh, testing data sheets, one of the things it's going to ask us is what type of insulation, um, and it'll ask us, you know, what the uh, percent insulation level was. So the insulation level defines three insulation thicknesses within a voltage class. Typically, you will have 100%, 133%, and 173% on the insulation level. The percent insulation level is a reference to the insulation thickness based on underground systems or slow-acting isolation schemes. 100% voltage level is known as the grounded circuit. 133% level refers to ungrounded systems or cables that may have a uh, clearing requirement that the 100% uh, cannot meet, but there is assurance uh, that the faulted area will be de-energized in a certain amount of time. So if you do have slow clearing schemes, again, the solution is to go to 133% insulation level in order to handle the slow clearing scheme and the longer exposure of the fault current. Now, 173% refers to a cable system where the time required to de-energize is indefinite or more time is needed for the fault to clear 
than in a typical 133% uh, insulation thickness. There are certain insulation percent levels that correspond with another voltage class as well. For instance, a 5 kV cable insulation uh, level thickness of 133% is the same as an 8 kV cable at 100% uh, insulation thickness. However, this does not mean that an 8 kV cable can be replaced with a 5 kV cable at 133%. Before any replacement is made, one must know about the AKV cables protection scheme. The um, AKV, yes. Sorry, this is Kristen. It looks like um, Mohammed has a question. He's got his hand up. Okay, uh, Mohammed, you should be able to unmute your uh, microphone. Yeah. So uh, from this from this table, I want to understand. Like you mentioned that uh, one seventy three percent refer to cable system where time required to de-energize is indefinite or more time is needed for the fault to clear. Then I don't understand this stanza. Like, can you can you clarify this one? Like, I cannot. Okay. The, the, Let me try explaining it again. Um, okay. Basically, when we're looking at the insulation level, okay, the percent mm -hmm. insulation level or the thickness of the insulation, obviously, one reason why we want to go thicker is because we anticipate greater stresses, right? So, mm -hmm. if the clearing times, if the transients, if the bill levels you know, are what we would refer to as like a grounded system, quick clearing, um, we can go with X amount of percentage, okay? And that we refer to as 100% insulation level, okay? The thickness required for that type of application. However, if we have a long clearing time on the circuit, the maximum available fault current flows longer, the longer it takes for the circuit to clear, right? Well, one thing that we don't want to have happen is the cable to heat up and fuse like a fuse, right? We don't want it to pop as a result of all of this extra fault current traveling for a longer extended period of time. So how do we safeguard that? We go thicker in insulation, right? In order to uh, have the cable allow to handle that extra stress on it. So really, when we are looking at the percent insulation, uh, 100, 133, or 173%, we are looking at different uh, um, scenarios where we might need to thicken or beefen up on the insulation in order to accommodate the bill ratings, uh, potential transients that may occur in these circuits, or the clearing times on the circuit. Did that help a little bit more? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. It means that the, the insulation, the normally you know that the insulation is related to the voltage, to the voltage rating. Like whatever the voltage increase, the insulation percent increase. Um, right. The, so we yeah. rate it to the voltage, but also we look at the fault condition and the clearing time. So at any given voltage, if the clearing time, for instance, as we see here at 15 kV, all three of these insulations are rated for the 15, but the thicknesses may vary now depending upon the other factor, clearing time and fault currents. So uh -huh. both have to yeah, be taken yeah. into consideration in order to optimize the performance of the circuit. Uh, I got it. I got it. Yeah, thanks. Uh, you're welcome. And Kristen, thank you so much for uh, my head's turned to my center monitor. I wasn't looking on my side monitor of all the attendees. So you keep me honest. If you see those hands come up, you just, you know, interrupt me and uh, we'll go ahead and stop and clarify. Very good. <laughs> thank you so much, Tom. All right, insulation categories. There are several types of insulation and they are categorized by the manufacturing process. Either they are classified uh, as an extruded dielectric, like we see here, where the dielectric material is actually formed onto the conductor through an extruding process, and in essence, it becomes a solid dielectric. Or 
it is a laminating process where, for instance, in the good old fashioned paper insulated lead covered cable, we build the dielectric through layers of oil impregnated paper. Extruded dielectric goes through a process where the material is uh, melted and then extruded onto the conductor, as I kind of briefly mentioned. The examples of this are going to be your polyethylenes, cross-linked polyethylenes, whether they're the high molecular weight, the uh, TR or tree retardant uh, cross-linked polyethylenes. These are all extruded dielectrics. Also, any of your EPRs, ethylene propylene rubbers, are all extruded uh, process. The laminated best example is the uh, paper insulated lead covered or PILC cables. Now, there are uh, obviously the two types of uh, extruded, as I mentioned, the polyethylenes. It could be your cross link polyethylene, your thermosets, your high molecular weight polyethylenes, thermoplastics, or your tree uh, retardant uh, XLPEs, again, which would fall under the thermoset designs. The generations of polyethylene really came about the first adopted into the industry going back into the late 1970s. Uh, the very first of the uh, polyethylenes was standard polyethylene, then it migrated to cross-link polyethylene. The problem with the polyethylenes uh, in the early days, uh, as they started to get service age, we noticed in their aging, there was a phenomenon called water treeing or water ingress. As moisture would get into the polyethylene, uh, eventually these water pockets would begin to form channels, which would then act as conductive electrodes within the uh, insulation, leading to a tree growth and eventually a cable failure. So when we moved from the first generation polyethylenes into the second generation of polyethylenes, here's where we start to see like the high molecular weight polyethylenes being introduced into the marketplace. And again, part of this design was to try to help the cable be less uh, um, pervious to moisture. <clears throat> the third generation, is the TR XLPEs. We start to see these hit the market in the uh, early to mid 1990s, and they are the dominant polyethylenes that are in the marketplace today is the TR XLPEs. Again, they don't stop the water ingress problem, but they do a very fine job of slowing the process down and helping to fend off the amount of moisture getting into the cables. Most of your TR uh, XLPEs nowadays are carrying about the same predicted life expectancy as your ethylene propylene rubbers, which were always selected due to their resilience with water treeing. Okay, and then that obviously then leads me right into the ethylene propylene rubber or the EPR cables. Again, the benefits of these cables, uh, they greatly reduce the effects of water treeing and electrical treeing. They are utilized in more harsh environments. Typically, we do see these used in industrial facilities, um, areas like in petrochemical. Uh, so in more harsh environments, we normally see the ethylene propylene rubber design. The sad part, though, with EPRs, when we deal with a uh, polyethylene cable, whether it's cross-link polyethylene, TR cross-link polyethylene, high molecular weight uh, um, uh, polyethylene, polyethylene is a pure polymer. It doesn't matter where you buy it or who is using it. It is the exact same material. When we're dealing with ethylene propylene rubber, <coughs> it is a copolymer mixture and different manufacturing processes uses different compounds. They may be using mineral fill, they may be using uh, additions of carbon black into the dielectric, um, but again, the recipes will vary depending upon the manufacturer. And from a cable fault locating standpoint, it doesn't matter as much, but if you are also doing, for instance, tan delta testing, 
diagnostic testing, what EPR compound is being used is definitely going to be an important uh, factor in order to better analyze uh, the TAN Delta results because again, the different compounds will lead to different dielectric losses in the dielectric structure. So knowing that will be obviously a benefit when doing the TAN Delta test. Again, if you're interested in more about TAN Delta testing, visit our uh, video library of our past webinars and uh, cable diagnostic testing uh, part two we really take a deep dive into the TAN Delta test. All right, the main polyethylene-based uh, medium voltage cables are crossing polyethylene and TR crossing polyethylene. Uh, again, TRs are probably the most noted that we see today. Uh, again, originally there was just the polyethylene and it was, you know, kind of, you know, the mainstay, but the improvements to water ingress, improvements to thermal stability, led its way up to the new modern day TRXLPEs. And we kind of went through the history there. Now, the various styles of EPR are made from different chemical compounds, and each has slight pros and cons in the design. The most prominent that you hear referenced in EPRs is you'll hear reference to EPR black, EPR brown and EPR pink. EPR black goes back to the early, or I should say late 1960s. Uh, and the black appearance was caused by the addition of carbon black being mixed into the insulation compound. Now you might be sitting back going like, why in God's name would you go ahead and put carbon black, a conductive element, into a dielectric? I mean, why would you put something conductive into a dielectric? Well, the answer to that and why EPRs are what they are, a lot of times you will hear EPR cables referred to as PD-free uh, cables. Not a PD resistant cable, but a PD free cable design. The purpose of putting a semiconductor into the dielectric and thus increasing the dielectric loss of the circuit was done intentionally. Because if there were imperfections in the dielectric, such as like a, a gas pocket or void, okay, the dielectric strength of the void is going to be weaker than the dielectric strength of the surrounding material. Now, if the material, though, was made with high dielectric losses, charge would not build inside the void, thus causing a possible breakdown or partial discharge. But due to the high dielectric losses, the extra current would leak out through leakage current, not forming a charge inside the void and not causing a discharge which would then erode and deteriorate the cable. So EPRs are intentionally made with some semiconductive material in the dielectric in order to increase dielectric losses so that any charges within possible microvoids in the dielectric are bled away as leakage current and not allowed to form PD in them. One of the earliest methodologies was the use of carbon black, giving the black appearance to the dielectric. We do still see this uh, from time to time in the industry. In the world of TAN Delta testing, uh, EPR black or uh, this variation has the highest dielectric losses and therefore would have the highest uh, TAN Delta numbers when testing them. EPR Brown refers to a uh, variation that was first brought into the market by the company Curite. Okay, it is generally brown, but there are instances where a black pigment was added uh, to the insulation, making them appear black. Again, EPR Brown ranges anywhere from a very deep mocha type color up to a very light beige or tan color. 
Around 2006, uh, Curate uh, consolidated its insulation compound in favor of a high voltage Curate, which was uh, then manufactured in and around the 1970s, but it also falls under the category of brown. It is a discharge resistant design where black was considered more of a PD free design. The brown is considered more of a discharge resistant design. Again, it's got slightly better dielectric loss capabilities, but again, intentionally, it does still have relatively high dielectric losses so that charges are not allowed to form inside microvoids, but instead bleed the charge away through the, the function of leakage current. Now, if PD were to occur in this type of design, immediate action is not required. It can go a long time with PD activity in it without really any degradation to the overall performance of the dielectric. Now, again, obviously the theme of today's class is cable fault locating when a fault has occurred. But if your company is getting involved in partial discharge testing on medium voltage cables, understanding these characteristics are important because, again, if I knew this cable to be Curite EPR Brown and I was getting low levels of partial discharge detected in it, I'm not going to be chicken little. I'm not going to, you know, scream to the king, the sky is falling, oh my God. I'm basically just going to go to the client and say, we're going to monitor and keep an eye on this, but... Uh, fortunately, based on the fact that it is EPR Brown, we can have PD for extended periods without degradation of performance. Now, on the next one that we're going to talk about, EPR Pink, if PD appears in an EPR Pink uh, insulation, you better take immediate action. It's going to go to fault relatively quickly. So again, understanding the materials is important, whether it be for the partial discharge analysis, tan delta analysis, or knowing if the circuit is in high risk of failure. All right, EPR pink formulations, uh, they came about in around the 19, mid-1970s, 1974. Uh, the uh, carbon black uh, was basically uh, removed from the uh, uh, insulation. Once the carbon was removed, the lead oxide became observable and created a pink pigment uh, to the cable. So really this, you know, EPR pink is just another evolution of the carbon black, but they removed the uh, carbon and the lead oxide then created uh, a pink uh, coloration to it. Probably one of the most notable manufacturers of uh, um, EPR pink is going to be your Okanite cables. They're almost all predominantly pink. Now, in these formulations, again, uh, if PD occurs, it will degrade the insulation at an accelerated rate. So in EPR black, uh, the uh, PD will take a long time, you know, for PD to ever form in an EPR black. But if it does, it will then accelerate and go to fault relatively quickly. In an EPR pink, it will take a lot to create the PD. But if PD occurs in pink, it will accelerate, go to fault quickly. EPR brown, it's easier to get PD in it. But if there is PD in the EPR brown, it can go a long time before it really grows to a point of worrying. So again, understanding your EPR flavors. Again, if you're doing diagnostics and you're making recommendations to your clients, as far as you know, how often they should be testing, et cetera. These obviously are important factors to take into consideration. All right, laminated cables. These are, I mean, the most robust, uh, awesome cables ever, ever manufactured. Problem is lead is uh, a hazardous material. It is extremely expensive. These are heavy, bulky, cumbersome. So even though they are the probably the ultimate 
Supreme Cable ever manufactured in New York City, Manhattan. There are original PILC cables that are over 100 years old, still working perfectly. But for the reasons I mentioned, lead being a hazardous material, size, weight, cost, flexibility, we just don't see these awesome, awesome cables much anymore. They're a dying breed. Let's get this section wrapped up so we can take our first morning break because I am in desperate need of coffee. But let's continue on with insulation shield. Again, the insulation shield is semiconductive uh, and just like the conductor shield, it's there to smooth out any imperfections uh, in the interface between the dielectric and the metallic shield. So again, it's kind of acting as this, between the uh, conductor shield and the insulation shield, these two semiconductive layers, in essence, is creating a Faraday cage or equipotential zone around the dielectric, thus reducing stress and also eliminating any imperfections uh, in the materials. Now, when we talk about the metallic shields, obviously the metallic shield is going to be a possible current carrying component. Uh, in a fault situation, all of the fault current is going to travel back on the metallic shield of the cable. So therefore, we have to make sure that we have adequate uh, fault current carrying capabilities in the shield design. Now, there are numerous styles. You have uh, a style that is called the Unishield. This was really one manufacturer, BI or excuse me, BCC. No, I was correct the first time. BICC was the cable manufacturer. They came out with this design called Unishield, where the last three layers of the cable were all bonded as one material and then the uh, uh, metallic shield was embedded into that material. Not a bad cable design, but a royal pain in the backside if you ever have the misfortune of having to splice one of these cables. They are horrible to work with. Concentric neutral wires, we do see this pretty dominant in the electrical utilities. Uh, and normally concentric neutral wires, we see this a lot more with uh, the combination of polyethylene or cross-link polyethylene uh, insulation. Ribbon cable or tape shield, we do see this a lot in the industrial environment. And again, the variations are basically there to either handle expected uh, fault current carrying capabilities uh, they're also uh, um, selected uh, based on the diameter of the cable that we're trying to aspire to um, uh, for overall thickness. Again, if we're trying to stuff a lot into a small location, these are all considerations that go into the shield type uh, selection. What we do normally find is in industrial application, the combination of EPR and tape or ribbon shield seems to be the ultimate cable design to match the applications that this market is looking for. Uh, when we look at electrical utilities, we do typically find that they uh, typically use aluminum conductors, TR cross-link polyethylene uh, um, insulations or dielectrics, and they usually select that because of the extremely low dielectric losses in polyethylene. Um, and they typically use stranded uh, conductor uh, or stranded neutral wires. Now, also, for fault locating, the difference between a ribbon or tape shield and a concentric neutral wire normally does not have an overbearing effect for fault locating. However, though, if you ever do get involved with partial discharge testing, tape shield or ribbon cables uh, ribbon shield cables, the overlapping layers of the ribbons where they overlap, let me try to get on camera here, there we go, 
where they overlap. If oxidation forms on that overlap, inductance is going to build and any of the discharge transients that oscillate on the cable that partial discharge testing needs to capture in order to map locations, these high frequency transients on a ribbon shield will attenuate very, very quickly. So whenever we're dealing with ribbon shields, I never promise a client that we can do partial discharge testing. Further testing of the cable is going to be warranted. I may go out using a device called a time domain reflectometer. We're going to learn a lot about what this tool does when we get into the fault locating portion, but it's sending high frequency pulses into the cable. If I'm able to pick up and map locations using a TDR, that cable is a good candidate for partial discharge testing, which is going to use a similar technology in order to capture the PD transients and perform cable mapping. If the cable and that ribbon is deteriorated and is choking back these high frequencies and I cannot even see the end of the cable when using my time domain reflectometer, I basically will just tell the client, I'm sorry, your cable is not a candidate for PD testing. There's way too much attenuation. I'll charge you a whole lot of money and give you very poor analytical results in return. And the last is going to be the jacket on the cable. The jacket obviously has several great benefits. Um, I do see we have a couple questions that came in. Let me finish this uh, thought and then I'll jump onto those questions. Okay, the jacket will tell us who the manufacturer is. The jacket will tell us what type of insulation is being used or dielectric, what the RMS phase to phase rating of the cable is. It will tell us what the uh, diameter or the uh, um, thickness of the conductor mill size, and it will tell us what insulation level is being used. Okay. Also on the jacket, you will have length markers. So if on the jacket, normally at the terminations, you can also determine cable lengths by the length markers. Obviously, the most important is the jacket protects the cable from contaminations getting into the metallic shields, from eroding the semiconductive layers, and ultimately from getting into the dielectric material itself. All right, going to the questions, can all metallic shields be considered or used as concentric neutrals or, uh, click on here to get the whole thing, Okay, uh, can be used as concentric neutrals, or is it only a specific cable type? Okay, let me see if I understand that, or or specific uh, metallic shield type. Okay, can metallic shields be considered or used as concentric neutrals? Oh, yes, all the shield types are considered concentric neutrals, whether it's ribbon, um, whether it's flat strand, round strand, they all serve the same function. They are the current carrying member uh, in a fault scenario. And if you're using dual bonding, they also carry your circulating currents. So yeah, concentric neutrals are basically the same as a metallic shield. Now, there are some other cable designs out there. Again, you do have the individually shielded uh, um, three core cables, uh, the XLPE insulated core cables, uh, three core paper insulated lead covered cables. So again, there are some different variations that you'll see, but generally speaking, they all follow that six layer model. Conductor, uh, conductor shield, dielectric, insulation shield, a neutral or uh, metallic shield, and then a jacket. That concludes our first module. See you in 15 minutes. When you come back, click your hands up icon, letting us know that you are back and ready to continue. All right, I'll see you in 15. All right, let's go into uh, cable aging and deterioration next. 
Now, a power cable fails basically when the local electrical stresses are greater than the local dielectric strength of the dielectric materials in that area. Reliability and the rate of failure of the whole cabling system is going to depend on the difference between the local stress at any given point in that system and the local strength at that point. Therefore, a failure of the dielectric results in an electrical puncture or flashover at a location of the degraded dielectric, the area where the cable insulation finally broke down and failed. This flashover can occur between two dielectric surfaces, such as uh, the cable insulation and joint insulation, or it can uh, occur as an external flashover at the cable termination point. A cable failure can occur as a result of the uh, normally applied 50, 60 hertz voltage or during a transient voltage, such as a lightning strike creating a surge on the line or possibly just switch, doing switching on the circuit can cause momentary surges if the dielectric is weak enough, even a switching surge can pop it into failure. As time progresses in the cable system age, the bulk dielectric strength begins to degrade. The main aging factors of an extruded dielectric is going to be electrical. Although under abnormal situations that we're going to cover, thermal aging can also be quite significant and quite a large contributing factor to the cable failing. Again, I highly encourage you see that uh, webinar on uh, um, premature failures at wind farms. Thermal degradation, uh, particularly those of you that have wind farms uh, in high temperature uh, barren locations like West Texas, uh, you know, Southern California, um, these areas, uh, thermal resistivity of the uh, ground do become factors. The electrical aging mechanisms uh, are going to include partial discharge activity, electrical treeing, water treeing, which will eventually convert into electrical treeing, and charge injection occur at contaminant areas defects in the dielectric, protrusions uh, in the dielectric, or voids within the dielectric, and thus they tend to be localized in nature. Now, when we look at types of deterioration, uh, we have what we call the dry electrical. Now, dry electrical, this normally is going to point toward manufacturing imperfections, or it's going to point to craftsmanship imperfections. It does create increases in the local stress leading to either early failure or a high rate, accelerated rate of aging. <clears throat> Excuse me. And in this category, we typically th see things like uh, cracks developing in the dielectric material, possibly a contaminant that was left in place in the extruding process, air voids uh, or micro voids left in the dielectric as a result of uh, contamination or bad uh, um, extruding. Now, under the areas of the poor workmanship, this is going to be where we have, you know, the remnants of bad cutbacks. We have the remnants of poor sanding uh, um, and or possible knife cuts or knife gouges in the dielectric. All of the above will basically start to cause electrical tree growth and will cause partial discharge activity to occur over time. Okay, so again, these voids that may be left in, contaminants in the insulation, the poor application of the metallic shield in that bonding process, if it left the lamination or uh, voids, again, that's going to be home to partial discharge. Protrusions on the cable is going to form an electrode function and it's going to cause an electrical tree to grow off of that protrusion. Poor application of the jackets, uh, again, you know, is going to go ahead and lead to cable failure or allow contaminants to get in 
to the cable. Now, the thing with dry electrical, if you're doing acceptance testing on the cable, the traditional withstand test, whether you're doing uh, the 30-minute uh, VLF, one-hour VLF, or if you're doing DC high potential testing on new non-service age cable, these withstand tests are basically very good at finding most dry electrical failures uh, in the cable structure. I will say out of the uh, different waveforms, VLF or DC, DC is the worst at finding a dry electrical failure. Now you can prove this to yourself uh, in a very, very simple experiment. In order to drive this point home in a lot of my cable classes, what I would do is I would take 10 feet of a cable, 15 kV cable, whatever was laying around the yard. I would cut back both ends, throw terms on, uh, and basically I would do a high pot test on it. Prove that it was a good hunk of cable, no problem with the insulation. I then would take an eight penny nail and hammer it into the cable all the way down to the conductor. And I'd pull the nail out, but leave it dry, no contamination in the void that I just formed. I then put the DC high pot back on it. I'd get all the way up to operating voltage and start going higher and higher and higher. I would have to go quite an extent over operating voltage before that gouge, that hole that I made in the cable would actually flash over. So without letting it flash over, I would then take the DC voltage off and I would go ahead and put the VLF on it. And the VLF, typically, even before I'd reach operating voltage, would flash that over very quickly. Now, DC is great with finding any type of wet fault. If there's contamination, moisture, water treating, whatever, the DC does a good job of finding a wet failure. But a dry electrical, it is pathetic. Again, do a 5 kV megometer test with a big gaping hole in the insulation. If it's dry, free of moisture, you'll meg several hundred gig ohms, if not tera ohms. DC is very inefficient as a testing voltage or a testing waveform, which again is why the industry has greatly moved toward VLF. Again, Go watch uh, Cable Diagnostics uh, webinar part two. We really go into uh, this area. Well, part one, we talk about why DC has fallen from grace and why people just are getting away from high voltage DC testing. In part two, we pick it up with why VLF and why Tan Delta is the modern day bomb. You know, why we migrate to that technology. Okay, among the poor workmanship, obviously cuts, contamination, misapplied components or connectors can all lead to premature failures. Here again, we should kind of show uh, some wafer area where this actually was a uh, cut in the cable um, under electrical load and heating. It knows that it begins to spread open. Here we saw uh, a bunch of little imperfections in the extruding process. I mean, this one is greatly exa exaggerated. I mean, that's really poorly done, but again, it dramatizes the point. All right, thermal uh, deterioration. Thermal deterioration begins to cause oxidization in the insulation, begins to dry out the insulation. So it can start to lead into cracking. Uh, it does lead to weakened dielectric strength. Now, if you're doing tan delta testing and the cable is suffering from thermal degradation, you will notice that the tan delta increases. The dissipation factor of the cable increases. It becomes lossier as a result of the oxidation taking place in the insulation. 
Now, it does begin to cause uh, decomposition. It can actually start to lead to a delamination of the uh, either insulation shield or most likely is happening at the conductor into the insulation. It'll cause a delamination of the uh, um, conductor shield. Once we get that delamination and a void is formed, partial discharge will then follow, electric tree will grow, and circuit will fail prematurely. Again, the clue that this is, may be occurring is we start to see the tan delta number growing. Causes can be either excessive current for a given environment and operating condition. It could be that it was misdesigned, that they're using basically uh, an underrated current for the loads that they're carrying. Poor thermal resistivity of the earth, this is a big, big, big contributing factor. Or overpacked conduits, which lead then to poor thermal resistivity. Basically, in the world of poor thermal resistivity and what leads to this breakdown, think of a marathon runner, okay? Gentleman runs the Boston Marathon. Does very well. Good prime athlete, right? All right. Let's go ahead and let's take that prime athlete and let's suit him up with thermal long johns. We'll go ahead, put flannel shirt and pants on him. We'll then put one of those, uh, you know, sweatsuits, you know, that prevent air from breathing. And we'll put a parker on him for good measure. Now, let's see how far that runner can run before he passes over heat exhaustion because he cannot radiate the heat coming off of his body. And that's kind of what's happening to these cables that are prematurely failing as a result of overcrowded, overstuffed conduits or backfill with bad thermal resistivity properties. Basically, under load, the cable heats. It cannot dissipate the heat. We begin to cook the cable. Here we see a great example of thermal deterioration. This was one of the 35 kV cable samples that we brought back from Green Pastures Wind Farm in West Texas. This particular splice, it was uh, um, a shear bolt, uh, 3M shear bolt design splice. Here is the uh, conductor connector. This is the TR crosslink polyethylene, which normally has almost a uh, transparent to white color. Notice the color is charcoal gray. In areas you could actually feel the dielectric, it was mushy to the touch, where it was actually melting. This was extreme thermal degradation. Inside the, the splice body, these little divot areas that we're seeing, this is where the heat created a vacuum and it was sucking the dielectric into the little voids where the shear bolts had snapped off. One of the shear bolts uh, um, basically punctured into the uh, insulation uh, shield here and caused electrical tracking. The splice blew out after 18 months of service. When we did the root cause analysis, obviously we saw that the problem was thermal in nature. And one of the reasons why this particular job brought such concern and again, this is something you may want to consider when you're involved with cable fault locating. The first time we went out there uh, to Green Pastures, feeder number 10, I remember her well. We located the fault, we excavated, we went ahead and we decided to change all three splices since it was a premature failure after only 18 months of service. So for every one splice you pull out of the ground, you got to put two splices back in, okay? So on this first one, we didn't think too much about it. We thought, well, all right, maybe it was just some bad craftsmanship, some random, and we restored service. Customer was happy. They got back up and running. We went our merry way. It was only about maybe less than 30 days later. Uh, it wasn't even a full 30 days. 
all of a sudden, ring, ring, ring. Hey, it's our buddy at Green Pastures. What's happening? Oh, you got another cable failure. What circuit? Theater 10. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, we're on our way. We haul out to West Texas. Locate the fault. Takes us to yet another splice location. Now, this time when we unearthed it, I was growing concerned because, all right, this is two failures within 30 days of one another, two different locations, but again, on a circuit that is only 18 months old. Something's going on here. And the reason why I was getting concerned was I had the reputation of my company to think about. You know, if we just keep going out there finding faults and they keep occurring, and if the contributing factors are such that it's not bad craftsmanship of whoever installed these splices prior, if we don't get to the root cause, the splices that we're putting in the ground may begin to fail prematurely. Now the client looks and says, oh, you guys are just as bad as the old contractor. You suck when it comes to doing splices, blah, 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 and we lose reputation. So on the second go around, I said to the customer, I said, would you mind if I take those splices back to the lab with me? I'd like to kind of figure out what's going on here and what's causing, you know, your circuit failures, as I'm sure you would like to know. Well, when we took them back and we did the autopsy, definitely the problem was thermal. OK, I mean, the picture obviously shows just how bad the thermal degradation got. So now going back to the client, I said, can you provide me what your load data shows? You know, how badly loaded were these circuits? Well, when they did so, uh, we showed that the cable never carried more than 550 amps, which was well within the rating of that particular cable and uh, design structure uh, as far as dual end bonding, et cetera, et cetera. It was well within the design structure that 550 amps of load current should not have affected it. So we did look at, okay, what is the duration that it was carrying these high currents uh, or full loads? Well, like we see in most wind farm activity, turbine's spinning, nobody throttles back, you're making money. So it's carrying 550 amps, and on this particular one, it showed that oh, for just over 30-odd uh, days or something like that, you know, it was running at full peak loads. But again, going back to the original design paperwork, it should have been able to handle that from what we saw uh, and the records that they were able to provide to us. That led me down another path because I remembered back in 2006, uh, when I was a member of the Insulated Conductor Committee of the uh, IEEE Power Engineering Society, I had attended a uh, seminar in Phoenix, Arizona, and the people presenting were, were represented this company called Geotherm. They manufacture uh, thermally rated backfill, particularly for these type of applications. And I remember them talking about the thermal row or thermal resistivity of the soil and how it can lead to failures and not allow the cable to radiate heat properly. So with this information, um, I had conversations with uh, um, the uh, people at uh, Green Pastures. And again, they shared data and said, well, we did have thermal resistivity tested and the, the result came back and said native soil could be used, but it had to be ground up to a certain uh, particle size and it had to be compacted to a specified uh, uh, compaction or pressure. If that was done, it would have carried the proper thermal resistivity. Well, I said, well, that's interesting news because, you know, being there when we unearthed these cables, you know, to do the repairs, they were not compacted. You know, it looked like all they did was push the dirt back in and let Mother Nature start to slowly compact uh, the earth. So I said that was out of spec. I said, two, on the first trench, we pulled out half of a tire, pallet, barbed wire fence. I kid you not, you cannot make this stuff up. And there were rocks and gravel and so forth. So as far as your grounding it up to a certain per particle size, yeah, that was definitely off the table. Contractor never did any of that garbage. 
So I said, I suspect that your thermal resistivity is probably very poor. Well, nothing came out of these discussions for about another 40 days. 40 days after the second uh, failure on feeder 10, we get another call, another failure. We rush out. We find it at yet another splice location. This time, I brought a little handheld thermal resistivity meter with me. So after we unearthed the cable, stuck the probe in the ground, ran a thermal resistivity test. Sure enough, the thermal row was five times higher than what the design spec called out. These cables were burning themselves up. Corrective action from that point forward was uh, they went ahead, got in contact with Geotherm, uh, got several payloads of uh, thermal backfill in their yard, and every time a splice failed, when we would go out, render the repair, we would backfill it with the geotherm. And that seems to have slowed the pain for green pastures and feeder 10. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, they have not had a repeat failure on that feeder in five years. Unfortunately, the cable is seriously degraded. We did run uh, tan delta testing and it's showing the same life as a cable three times its age, four times its age. So they're never going to get a 30 years out of this cable, but at least we stopped, you know, the every 30 day cable failure. All right. Another big culprit of premature failing uh, in a cable or accelerated aging uh, and failure in a cable is water ingress. High density of small water trees getting into the cable itself. These form what we call either bow tie trees. And again, bow tie trees form in the dielectric. Normally, these are a result of poor manufacturing. Uh, during the extruding where moisture was left behind. A bow tie tree will initially under electrical load will grow rapidly, but then it will go dormant very quickly. And it can be there for a long, long period of time before it actually will go to failure. The more dangerous tree that we don't like to see is the one called the vented tree. This normally is going to uh, be produced at one of the outer extremities. Either the cable was not capped properly, maybe put in a storage yard and the conductor was laying on the ground and began to wick moisture up the conductor. So the moisture gets in through the conductor, begins to pull into the dielectric, and the tree and moisture will grow in the direction of the electrical stress. So it's going to grow through and try to bore its way to the outer metallic shield. Or if it came in from the outer jacket was damaged and moisture got in under the jacket, eventually it will ingress into the insulation shield and begin to grow toward the conductor. Now, the vente trees, these are a problem because they will begin to grow uh, in a more rapid fashion. Um, and what will happen is at the base of, if you can see where my mouse is circling here, at the base of the water tree, if the moisture begins to evaporate or vape out, it leaves a void where an electrical tree or partial discharge will start. Once the electrical tree starts, it will then begin to grow itself through the dielectric and then lead to failure. So a water tree will not necessarily lead to failure, but a water tree that then leaves the absence of moisture and leaves behind a dry pocket will then convert to an electrical tree, which will then grow and lead to cable failure. Okay, so here again, we just show some wafers of some cable and uh, some, again, here we see large moisture pocket here we see where the uh, electrical tree began to grow and dominate. All right, another form of deterioration. And again, we do find this uh, in industrial complexes, petrochemical plants. Uh, we find this problem a lot, again, those poor wind farms. Where do you put a wind farm? 
agricultural land. So chemical attack will, if it gets into the dielectric, will again dry out the dielectric, cause uh, cracking, uh, and it could be caused by transformer oil leaks or fertilizers. So again, out in farmland where, they, again, they put a lot of these wind farms, every year the farmers are putting down fertilizer so they can rotate their crops, and I'm not a farmer, but they do what farmer farmers do, okay? Well, these fertilizers are not good for the cables. Floods and contaminated water, particularly if you got jacket problems and, the wa and that contaminated water uh, is getting in under the jacket, that's going to begin to cause chemical attack on the uh, insulation shield and eventually on the dielectric itself. And petrochemical spills also will have an impact on this. And here we can see different forms of deterioration. Unjacketed cable that's left in the soil. Again, we go back to that early breed of first generation uh, cable that was uh, direct buried, unjacketed. The concentric neutrals, metallic shields, whatever you want to call that outer metallic layer, begins to corrode. This goes ahead and now it no longer distributes the electrical stress uniformly during these corroded areas where resistance builds up. It creates a localized area of stress, which then begins to deteriorate uh, the uh, insulation shield and eventually the dielectric at that location, leading to a cable failure. All right, so in review here, can I keep an eye on my time? Okay. A power cable fails when the local electrical stresses are greater than the local dielectric strength of the dielectric materials. Dielectric, dielectric, dielectric. Say that 10 times fast. Reliability and the rate of failure of the whole cabling system is going to depend on the differences between the local stress and any given point in the system and the local strength at that point. A failure of the dielectric results in an electrical puncture or a flashover at that location of the degraded uh, dielectric. This flashover can occur between two dielectric surfaces, such as the cable insulation and joint insulation, or it can occur as an external flashover at the cable termination. A cable failure can occur as a result of the normally applied 50-60 hertz or it can occur during a transient voltage, such as a transient surge as a result of a lightning strike or as a switching surge on the line. As time progresses and the cable system ages, the bulk dielectric strength begins to degrade and weaken. The main aging factor of extruded dielectric cables is electrical, although under abnormal conditions, thermal aging can be quite significant. And again, I really got my lesson on thermal aging, uh, you know, when working the wind farms in West Texas. Uh, there, I, I, yeah, I learned a lot about the importance of thermal resistivity, proper compaction of the ground, et cetera, et cetera. Became the foremost leading expert in dirt. The electrical aging mechanisms, such as partial discharge, electrical training, water training, converting into electrical training, charge injection, these occur at locations of contaminants, defects, protrusions, and voids, and thus they tend to be very localized. So when they do fail, you know, it's not the entire, you know, 500 feet of cable failed. It failed at a specific location where these defects grew to the point of failure. All right, that is going to conclude the aging. We are going to move on to what we call the art of cable fault location. Now, primarily, we're going to really focus our time and effort on medium voltage uh, cabling, basically 5 kV up through uh, 69 kV. I believe IEEE refers to it as medium voltage. Um, but in the process, in some of these techniques that we're going to be discussing, 
We are also going to talk about low voltage cables, 480 volt cables, uh, you know, unshielded uh, 1 kV cables, 416 cables. Uh, well, actually, a 416 cable, I would probably consider that medium voltage, but we will talk about everything from telephone wires, coaxial cables used in video, uh, um, low voltage electrical power cables, up through your medium voltage uh, um, cable classes. But again, our focus is really going to be on the medium voltage. All right. Now, to say that cable fault location can present challenges, well, that would be an understatement. Are we dealing with a low voltage cable? Possibly a medium voltage cable. Is the cable shielded? Is it unshielded? Does the cable run in duck? lay along trays, or is it direct buried in the ground? How we answer these questions is going to determine the equipment, the techniques, and the strategies that we're going to use for successful fault location and repair. Now, in this training webinar, we're going to delve into the topic of effective, or excuse me, into the topic of efficient cable fault locating strategies and techniques. We're going to focus our discussion on the techniques and strategies for testing of the cable, identifying and profiling the type of faults that we're dealing with, whether they be low voltage or medium voltage cables. We're then going to talk about the advantages and the limitations of each of the techniques uh, that can be potentially utilized for finding the fault. So another way to look at this is we are going to become the professional golfer of the cable fault locating world. Whereas a skilled golfer has to be able to analyze the situation that they're in uh, before reaching into their bag of and selecting a club. They've got to take a look at well, what is the lay of the turf? Uh, you know, do we need to get elevation on the shot? Am I going for distance? Am I going for, you know, uh, again, I'm not a golfer. And during power tests, we went to uh, oh, some golf place where uh, you sit there and you drive the ball and everybody laughs at me because I hack and chop at it and I don't drive it. Um, so I am not a golfer. Uh, I'm out of my league trying to do this analogy, but hopefully you golfers do get the idea that, you know, there is skill in selecting what club in order to get the most efficiency. Now, it's kind of the same with cable fault locating. Can you play 18 holes of golf using nothing but a putter? I mean, the answer is yes, you can do it, but it's not going to be a very efficient game. It's going to be a very stressful game, okay? But it is possible to play 18 holes of golf with a putter. Reason why you have the different clubs is to address efficiency in moving that ball from point A to point B under different conditions. Okay. There are different fault locating techniques in order to efficiently uncover, locate the defect under a variety of circumstances. There are certain techniques that you can apply them, and based on the profile of the fault, they will never work, okay? So we're going to learn how to use our fault locating tool bag. And where's my mouse? There it is. All right, get me off screen. Now, before rushing out to the fault, and I, I get it, you know, as a service provider and a service company, Sometimes it's an emergency call out uh, and we just want to jump in our trucks and we want to get rolling. OK, try to refrain from doing that. If you've got the client on the phone, try to gather some basic information before just grabbing things and running out to the job site. Because what I have found through extensive experience is technicians 
prematurely running out to the jobs and carrying the wrong equipment or the wrong tools and then misapplying the tools that they have and in some cases not only causing themselves a tremendous amount of stress but stressing out the client's cable and setting the client up for future failures so before just jumping in that truck and blazing down the highway what is some of the basic information we should be trying to gather first and foremost what is the voltage rating of the cable is it a low voltage cable or medium voltage cable there are some techniques uh, for instance you may have heard the term thumping a cable thumping a cable is where we're going to put high voltage surges down a cable with the hope that this high voltage surge is going to break down the fault cause it to arc over and create a sound on the surface of the ground thump thump now although this technique can be used very safely in medium voltage cable cable that has a concentric neutral or metallic shield because when we thump it that fault current has to carry a controlled path back to the equipment in medium voltage cable it is safe to thump if you tried using a thumping technique on a low voltage unshielded cable you are causing an electrical hazard in that entire environment again going back in the early days I remember uh, utilities trying to thump on low voltage cables blowing toasters out of the wall uh, in one situation, uh, literally, a cow that was leaning up against a uh, um, metallic fence, they thumped the low-voltage cable. The fault current traveled back on the metallic fence and killed the cow. All right? They all had steak that night, but imagine if it was the farmer's daughter that was leaning up against that fence. Again, unsafe. So we need to know, what are we dealing with? Is it low-voltage cable? If so... What are our techniques that we use? Is it medium voltage cable? If so, what are the techniques that are best suited for it? Okay, does the cable have a common shield? Or are there multiple conductors within the cable body, like in a tricor cable? Again, this might be of interest because, you know, once we find the fault, if I'm also going to be rendering the repair, what type of splice kit might I need, okay? Is the cable direct buried? Is it in conduit? Why am I, oh, I'm rubbing my hand on the mouse. There we go. All right. Sorry about that. Okay, is the cable direct buried? Is it in conduit? Is it in trays? Is it inside gear? This is going to be important because what we're going to learn is there is a pre-location methodology that will tell us very quickly where along the cable the failure took place, but the pinpointing uh, of the cable uh, fault, if it's in direct buried, I need to know the exact dig location because I don't want to dig up the entire cable trench, okay? However, if the cable is in conduit, I'm not going to bust through the sidewalk and bore down into the cable so my strategy at this point is only to localize the fault between two volts or two manholes so even though my pre-locate might be the same I'm no longer interested in a direct pinpoint I just need to isolate between two points again if the cable is in trays uh, again my strategy of pinpoint is going to be different than what I would deal with for a direct berry or what I might do with a conduit. Is it inside gear? Again, if I'm using a thumping technique and I'm going to be causing sparks or surges inside of gear, does that create an environmental or a safety hazard? Again, I need to know this. What is the approximate length of the cable? Again, am I dealing with, you know, 300 feet of cable at an industrial plant that's been isolated? Am I looking at, like, on a residential loop circuit, uh, you know, four to 500 feet between transformer pads in an isolated situation? Am I dealing with a uh, collector feeder cable of 15 miles length at a wind farm? 
length matters. It's going to determine what size, for instance, thumper I might use if that's going to be one of the techniques that I'm going to be utilizing. If I'm using one of the pre-location techniques like time domain reflectometry, does my cable radar, for lack of a better word, have appropriate range to measure 15 feet of cable? So length of the circuit will matter in the selection of my tools. Are there splices? What kind of terminations are being used? Again, if there's splices, I'm immediately going to suspect that I might have failed splices and the cable is okay. What kind of termination? I'll, I've got to connect onto the circuit. If they're using T bodies, if they're using elbows, do I have the appropriate adapter in order to connect my equipment onto the circuit? I don't want to show up on the job site and find out that I have no way of connecting onto the circuit. So this needs to be a question that is resolved before loading the truck and blazing down the highway. All right, now, once we've answered these basic questions, now we can begin to potentially load up our truck, blaze on down the highway properly equipped. And while we're driving down the highway to get to the job site, we can already be thinking about our strategy. Now, <clears throat> excuse me. In the world of cable fault locating equipment, this is a huge market. You have equipment that is optimized and designed for medium voltage applications. Here are examples of these things that we call thumpers, these high voltage surging devices. You have pinpointing tools. Here we show like a geophone, uh, which will amplify the thumping sound. Uh, so again, depending on soil conditions, I might not hear the thump by, with my naked ear. I might need some amplification. You have other units that are uh, um, like Murray Loop, Wheatstone Bridge uh, technologies in order to find cable faults. And don't worry, I'll explain how they work. Do we know the cable path? If it's direct buried in the ground, what good is a device that says, your fault is at 800 feet if I have no idea where to begin walking. Do I walk north, south, east, west, some variant? So locating cable path becomes an issue. You know, do I know the cable path? Do I have to pack a locator and tracer in order to find cable path? Now, in the low voltage cables, you also have the cable radar systems, the time domain reflectometers. We also have cable locators and tracers. We have a thing called a voltage gradient set. And don't worry, I'm going to explain how this is, is used. But again, there are tools that I would use and carry if I know I'm going out on low voltage. There are tools in, that I would use if I know I'm going out on medium voltage. Now, before doing anything, when I show up at the job site, it is a lack of discipline and it is foolish to just throw a piece of test equipment onto the circuit and start, for instance, thumping, okay? Shame on you if you go out there and you don't do anything but hook up a thumper and start pounding on a cable. Shame. Do some pre-testing, okay? At this point, you don't even know what you're dealing with. For all you know, the fault was at the transformer, that caused the circuit to trip, and the bloody cable is in perfect shape. And yes, this has happened to me numerous times responding to cable faults. Again, the circuit goes down, somebody panics, they immediately blame it on the cable, you rush out there, and you want to do a pretest. Validate that the fault is in fact in the cable that you are about to hook up to and profile what type of defect it is if you prove that the cable is in fact defective. So always do a pretest. Now in pretest, let's talk about what we want to do. If it is low voltage signal control wires, communication cables, or low voltage electrical power circuits, First and foremost, we want to do a continuity test. 
is the conductor in good shape all the way from point A all the way to point B? Now, I can use a simple ohm meter to perform this test, or I can use that device called the time domain reflectometer. Once I know that I have continuity in the circuit, I now want to take a look at the insulation's integrity. A good old-fashioned megometer, megger, insulation resistance test set, whatever you want to call this tool, I measure the insulation integrity. Am I getting the expected gig ohms of insulation resistance? Am I getting just a few k ohms? Am I showing a dead short circuit? Okay. So I want to first do an integrity test of the continuity. Can I see from point A to point B? Is the insulation in good shape? In a medium voltage cable, I do the exact same continuity. I can do it with an ohm meter or with a TDR. I again want to do an insulation integrity. Now here, I may test it with a megometer and I may still get a megohm or two of insulation resistance. Well, that looks pretty good. But what about the dielectric strength? There I might choose now to put a DC high pot or a VLF high pot on the cable. And I may choose to go to an elevated voltage to test the dielectric strength. Maybe there is in fact a fault, but it's a fault in a splice and still has some level of insulation integrity. So my megometer reading uh, you know, shows that I have a megohm or two of insulation resistance. However, when I elevate the circuit up to 9 kV, it flashes over, indicating that there's a clear fault. So again, we run some pretests in order to determine what are we dealing with. Now, for the continuity test, again, I don't need the precision of a micro ohm meter. I can use just a standard multimeter uh, set to the ohms function. If it's a low voltage uh, circuit, typically, you know, these are made up of three conductors, you know, in the tray, in the conduit, or thrown in the ground. I can connect between any two conductors. I place a jumping strap at the far end, and basically I'm just measuring loop resistance. So if when the uh, short is on, I get uh, basically low ohms or close to zero ohms, and when the short is removed at the far end, I get an over range, I've got continuity, okay? If I get excessive series resistance, well, that could also indicate that I have had jacket problems, and that I may be dealing with highly corroded conductors, okay? So continuity tests will tell me if I'm dealing with corroded conductors, if I'm dealing with an open conductor, or if I have full continuity through the conductor. On a medium voltage cable, I just simply go ahead and connect the ohm meter between the conductor and the concentric neutral, the metallic shield, whatever you want to call this outer metallic member. I connect across it at the far end, I short it out. It, while it's shorted, I should be getting very low to no ohms. With it open, I should be getting an over range. Now, if I have the time domain reflectometer, this tool is sending high frequency pulses down the cable. When these pulses encounter a large disruption to the natural characteristic impedance of the cable, a reflected pulse is going to come back to the TDR. Now, pulses that reflect off of an open circuit reflect back in phase with the injected pulse, so they come back in a positive orientation. Pulses that reflect back from a short circuit reflect back 180 degrees out of phase with the injected pulse. They reflect back in a negative position. So if I'm using the TDR to do a continuity test, again, I connect across two conductors. Open, I should get a positive. Short it, I should get a negative. And now I also have the luxury of a display marker and I can get a distance validating that that in fact agrees with the length of the cable. On a medium voltage cable, I just connect the time domain reflectometer between the conductor and the metallic shield. Open it, short it at the far end. 
if I see the up going to a down when I short, I know I'm looking at the far end, and again, I can get a distance measurement. Very fast, very simple test to perform. Now, if I'm doing a insulation integrity test, doing an insulation integrity test on three individual low voltage conductors can be dubious. Let's say that conductor A, literally somebody cut five inches of insulation off the cable, but the insulation of conductor B is perfect. If I connect the mega across that, even though there's a big gaping hole in the insulation on one of the conductors, but the second conductor has perfect insulation, the mega is going to show me a very high insulation resistance reading. So megging out low voltage cable may not always render a result indicating that there is in fact a fault in there. There is a technique uh, with the voltage gradient style test sets where if it is a jacket problem, I can connect between the conductor and earth and determine if I have excessive leakage into the earth, indicating that I, you know, which of the phases is faulted out or which has the insulation uh, degradation to it. In medium voltage cables, the insulation resistance test, in my opinion, has greater value because now I'm measuring across one single dielectric. So I've connected between the conductor and the metallic shield. Anything that is defective in that uh, um, dielectric, I'm going to show as high dielectric loss or high leakage current resulting in a low insulation resistance value. Now, depending upon how much insulation resistance I'm reading, that is going to help me identify what type of cable fault locating technique I'm going to use. If the resistance is too high, I might have to condition the cable and I might have to do a technique called burn down. I'll talk about this a little bit later, but where we reduce the insulation resistance to where the thumper is capable of breaking over the fault on every discharge. If the insulation resistance is too high and I'm thumping into a cable that is not breaking over properly, this can be a safety concern, it can cause a safety hazard, or it can cause extensive damage to the fault locating equipment, or it can cause damage to the cable that you're testing. We'll talk a lot about that when we get into talking about thumpers. All right. I may, on the medium voltage cable, want to do the dielectric test, uh, the dielectric strength test or withstand test. Now, this is an awesome test, too, because as I bring the voltage up, when the cable flashes over, okay, so let's say that I'm testing a 15 kV cable. I raise voltage up to 8 kV, the cable flashes over. A, that tells me that I have a fault. B, that tells me that the fault doesn't even occur until I have 8 kV present. Now, if I'm using a thumper, what voltage do you think I should probably thump at? 8 kV or greater. Because if I thump it at 5 kV and the fault breaks over at 8, I'm wasting my time. So here again is why I say, don't just hook up the bloody thumper and start pounding your cable. Run a insulation resistance test. Find out what type of insulation integrity you have. Run a high pot test. Determine at what voltage does the fault show itself. Because if you thump under that voltage, you're wasting your time. All right. Now that we've done some testing, we've got an idea of what we're dealing with, a high resistance fault, low resistance fault, short circuit, open conductor. Now it's time to do a locate. And for doing a pre-locate, again, there's numerous equipment out there. We have the thumpers, we have the cable radar systems, we have the pinpointing tools, in the low voltage world, we have different pinpointing tools and low voltage radars optimized for 
low voltage circuits. Again, here's where if we ask the first question uh, before loading the truck, am I dealing with medium voltage or low voltage? I pack the appropriate equipment in my truck and I'm off to the job site with the right tools. I've done my tests, now I wanna go ahead and do my pre-locate. Pre-locate is basically a technique that allows me to identify location of the fault without having to walk the entire cable path. So imagine how significant pre-locating can be. Again, let's go ahead and say I've got five miles of collector feeder cable. Do I really wanna walk five miles probing in the ground or listening for an event? What if I can hook up a tool and say, oh, the fault is at 3,220 feet from my connection point. Now I can go straight to that location and do the pinpoint, which is gonna be the easier day, walking all five miles, sniffing, listening, and probing, or using a pre-locating technique and saying, fault is at 3,280 feet. Let's go to that location. So pre-location is a very important tool. And if you are using a thumper, I don't have to be thump, 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 thump for eight, nine, 10, 12 hours as I'm walking, sniffing, and probing five miles of cable. So I'm reducing all of that stress that I'm putting out on the cable by allowing my equipment and my knowledge of how to use it to pre-locate and tell me where to go stand. So pre-locating is where we're now gonna go ahead and focus our time and effort. Pre-locating technique, if we're gonna be looking at low voltage cables, telephone wires, uh, coaxial uh, video cables, signal and control wires, uh, going through cabinetry and so forth, time domain reflectometer is an awesome tool. It's ideal for finding broken wires, open circuits, low resistance shorts, like short circuits, uh, conductor touching conductor. It'll identify landmark locations like splices and joints. The only limitation to the TDR is it transmits high frequency, but very low voltage pulses. So if the insulation resistance, as measured like with an ohm meter, is around 400 ohms or greater, the TDR might not have enough oomph to show the fault. If the fault is less than 400 ohms, the TDR will show it as a short or partial short circuit. So there is a limitation during your pre-testing of the low voltage circuit. That's why I always ask, pre-test it first. Is there insulation resistance? If there is, how high is it? If it's 400 ohms or lower, TDR is a good tool, should probably work in all uh, situations. If it's greater than 400 ohms, the TDR by itself may not do the trick. I might have to use what's called a resistive ratio bridge. A resistive ratio bridge is ideal for locating either short circuits or high resistance shorts, where I measure greater than 400 ohms of insulation resistance. Now, the only problem with a resistive ratio bridge is I need a good cable pair and a bad cable pair. I need reference in order to do the locate. Now, in most telecommunication type applications, multiple pairs is not a problem. In most signaling and control cabling, multiple pairs is not necessarily a problem. So finding a good pair, bad pair normally is not a problem. And the use of a resistive ratio bridge is quite viable. So let's start with this time domain reflectometer. Awesome tool, extremely safe to use. You can use it on the smallest gauge uh, telecommunication wire. You can use it on medium and high voltage cables. You can be handling the cable while sending the TDR pulses. They are under the 
electrical shock hazard values. Uh, I mean, in general, most TDRs transmit at around 9 to 10 volts. Some of the ones optimized for electrical power might transmit at around 25 volts, but they are under the electrical shock hazard identified by NFPA 70E or OSHA, which happens to be 50 volts or greater. So we're under the shock hazard. The TDR itself is a low energy device. There is no arc flash risk. So again, you can handle the TDR barehanded without any electrical hazards. Very safe to apply to just about any type of equipment or any type of circuit. So gorgeous, gorgeous tool. Again, as we were watching the animation here, the way the tool works, let me just get the animation going again. We transmit this high frequency, low voltage pulse down the cable. As it travels along the cable, if it encounters a disruption or change to the natural characteristics of the cable, part or all of that pulse is going to reflect or echo back. And on my display, I'm going to see the transmit and any echo or reflected patterns, thus providing me, in essence, a map of the cable. All right. So, what is causing the reflections, more specifically, is changes in the cable's characteristic impedance. Now, characteristic impedance Let's just call this top line the conductor. Let's call this bottom line a second conductor, or if it's a medium voltage cable, let's call this second line the concentric neutral or the metallic shield. Well, we already established that whether we're using aluminum or conductor, the material is going to have longitudinal resistance. The longer the conductor, the greater the resistance. The shorter the conductor, the lower the resistance, longitudinally speaking. If we place two metallic objects in parallel with one another, we are going to create inductance. If we place two metallic objects in parallel with one another and separate them with a dielectric material, we've created the properties of capacitance. And we have insulation resistance or conductance. Basically, all of these parameters is what we call impedance characteristic impedance of the cable. If any of these items change value, either the resistance changes, the inductance changes, capacitance or uh, um, conductance or insulation resistance changes, a mismatch of impedance will be created. That will, in essence, cause a reflection. Positive reflections will be caused by increases in longitudinal resistance at a given point or changes in the inductance of the cable at a given point. That will cause a positive reflection on the time domain reflectometer. Changes in capacitance at a uh, isolated location or changes in the insulation resistance at a location will cause a negative reflection. So now, not only does the TDR tell me where, but if it's in a positive, I know that it is either a open conductor, a high resistance splice where maybe it was not crimped properly, all that is going to change the longitudinal resistance, or it could be that the conductor and shield are separating from one another, causing a large inductive change. If the reflection is negative, I know that I'm probably dealing with either a short circuit, partial short circuit, or possible water ingress in the dielectric, all of which is going to affect capacitance and insulation resistance, thus causing negative reflections. So using a TDR is sort of kind of like reading a map. You know, first thing we had to do when reading a map was learn what the different images represented. Once we read the map legend and we knew what the different images represent, reading a map really wasn't all that difficult. Well, it's kind of the same with the TDR. Here, whether it's a low voltage, medium voltage, or high voltage, 
an open conductor or an open neutral is always going to reflect as a large positive reflection. Whether it is telephone wire or, you know, underground buried transmission cable. If there is a short circuit, conductor touching neutral or conductor touching conductor, it is always going to be a large negative reflection. A splice is actually two reflections that occur back to back. In the case of a splice, as the TDR pulse enters the splice, what it sees is the conductor and shield are separating. Think about how you build a splice, okay? You are separating the conductor and shield. So as you the pulse goes into the splice, conductor and shield are separating, causing an inductive change, hence a small positive reflection being created. As the TDR pulse leaves the splice, the conductor and shield are coming back to its natural separation set by the thickness of the dielectric. So as you leave the splice and the two objects are coming closer, capacitance is changing, causing a small negative reflection. Therefore, a splice is a small inductive change going in, a small capacitive change going out. The pattern that we see on the TDR looks like a sine wave or an S laying on its side. If it is somewhat symmetrical, we can say that it is a relatively nicely built splice. The proportion of inductive and capacitive changes are uniform. If the splice was damaged, maybe not enough mastic was used and moisture is getting in at the splice, we have the inductive change going into the splice, we have the capacitive change coming out, but we also have water getting into the splice, further altering the capacitance and insulation resistance. We get a bottom heavy splice pattern. And that in essence might be the root cause of why we're getting failures is because water is getting into the cable through the splice. A splice that was not crimped properly. Maybe it used uh, too large of a die. We didn't get good compression or crimp. So we have a high resistance connection, longitudinal connection. We see an increase of resistance. We have a top heavy splice. Now, TDRs actually also have the ability to shoot through transformers. They do not travel into the core or into the winding. They travel through the connections of the transformer. A transformer, if it's close to you, will look kind of like a Z pattern where we have a little bit sharper points than a splice, but again, it's the inductive change going in, capacitive change going out. If the splice is further away from us, it may begin to go through dispersion and spread out a little bit, in which case a transformer might look like a wet splice. But remember, with a TDR, I can take a measurement. So now I ask myself a question. Hey, I'm measuring this object at 300 feet. What's 300 feet away from me? Oh, that's my first transformer. Okay, problem solved. I've identified it as a transformer. A T connection or Y connection in the circuit. This is basically where we have a feeder and we tap in. Okay, we create a T or Y connection. We tap onto a circuit. All of the capacitance of this extra cable is going to be reflected at that point. So in the case of a T or Y tap, what we see is predominantly a large negative reflection that sort of looks like a check mark. This is where the energy is splitting. Part of the TDR pulse is going down the main feed. Part of the TDR pulse is going up along the branch. The capacitance of the branch is what we're seeing in the pattern, the capacitive change. And then finally, water train, excessive water ingress or water train, random negative reflections of varying amplitudes. Because again, water is not being evenly distributed and absorbed. Water is heavier here, weaker here, heavier, weaker, etc. We get these random negative reflections in the pattern. That is also an indication that the cable is aged, has contamination. If you're doing tan delta testing and you're showing high tan delta numbers, and you shoot it with a TDR, and you show sections of the cable with a lot of these wiggles and jiggles, those are wet saturated sections, those are what's contributing to your high tan delta numbers.
All right. How the tool works. As the name implies, it measures time. The time it takes a pulse to leave and the time for a pulse to return. It then measures the amount of time. It divides time in half because it's not interested in round trip. It's only interested in the distance out. So the time domain reflectometer internal measures time, divides time by two, and then uses what's called a velocity of propagation. How fast was that pulse traveling? By knowing speed of the pulse and the time, it can then calculate distances. So we need to know this thing called velocity of propagation. How fast will these electrical pulses travel on different cables? Well, the cable insulation, think of it like water and motor oil. If we take two marbles, we drop them one into a jar of water, one into a jar of motor oil, the uh, marble that drops through the water will travel faster than the marble that drops through the motor oil due to the motor oil having greater viscosity. Again, insulation type will cause the uh, pulses to travel faster or slower. Now, most of the cable fault locating test equipment that uses TDR technology in the appendix of the user's manual or somewhere in the user's manual, there will be a reference table. We identify the type of insulation, the KV, the sizing, and it will tell you what the velocity of propagation should be when using your TDR. Percent basically means the percent of the speed of light. So for instance, cross-link polyethylene, 15 kV, one aught cable, the electrical pulses will travel at 51% the speed of light. Now I know how fast they're traveling. All right, but I know there's a couple of you in the audience right now that are saying, uh, Tom, you said that this table appears in the user's manual. Life expectancy of a user's manual at my organization is 30 seconds upon opening the test equipment and then it vanishes, it, it disappears and I have no reference of the user's manual. So how do I know what velocity to use, man? All right, there's a couple ways you can figure this out in the field. One, if you hook up to a known length of cable, find the end of the cable, put a ground on it, watch the positive bounce to a negative, place your marker at that location. Now, if you are reading too low of a distance, increase your velocity number until you read the proper distance. If you are reading too much of a distance, decrease the velocity number until you read the proper distance. Now document that velocity, that is the speed of that type of cable. So if you don't know the velocity, but you have a sample conductor that you can hook up to, let the machine figure out the velocity. Adjust velocity until you read proper length. All right, I know there's a couple out there that says, yep, I don't know the length. You know, the one line doesn't provide me length or anything on it. I don't really know what the length is, Tom. And I don't have that bloody manual. I don't have your stupid reference table. This webinar is worthless. I should just go home. No, there's still yet another technique. Did you know that every cable manufacturer sells cable with a minimum of two ends? Ponder that. Set the velocity to some arbitrary value. Let's just say 50% the speed of light. Measure the approximate distance to the fault from end A. Trace it out, put a stick in the ground. Using the same velocity, go to the other end, shoot back. Wheel it out, put a stick in the ground. If the velocity was set too low, you are going to undershoot the fault from both ends. Where do you think the real fault location is going to be? Between the measurements. If you had too high a velocity, you're going to overshoot the fault from both ends. Where do you think the fault is? Okay. Now, if they fall short an unreasonable distance, recall your traces, 
increase the velocity, make the adjustments, bring the sticks in closer until you get to a reasonable zone. If you overshot it an unreasonable uh, amount, decrease the velocity, reshoot, bring the sticks in, adjust them until you get to a, a satisfactory distance. So even with buried low voltage cable, if you can find it with the TDR, measure from both ends and bracket out, you don't need a thump to pinpoint. You just adjust your velocities and bring those markers in to a reasonable dig location and away you go. So we've learned a little bit about the time domain reflectometer. Also, some people call it cable radar, yet other people call it pulse echo. Um, basically works by sending high frequency, low voltage pulses down a cable. If they encounter a change to the characteristic structure or impedance of the cable, a reflected pulse comes back to the TDR, thus allowing us to see the event and to make a measurement to the event. Reading a TDR is similar to reading a map. Once we know what the different uh, reflected patterns look like, we can then not only identify the event and its location uh, through the TDR signature. Now, on the screen, we show a waveform in blue, which is, represent, for instance, maybe the A phase of a cable. And we see uh, a waveform in red, which possibly represents the B phase of a cable. What are we seeing? And let's start with the blue waveform. What are we seeing along this uh, signature? Does anybody want to uh, go ahead and type into the chat what they believe they're seeing in the blue waveform? Okay, Joseph sees an open right here, definitely matches this image here. It is either an open conductor or open neutral, or it is the cable termination left unparked. Possibly a wet splice. Okay. Again, focusing on the blue. Uh, if there was one that was wet, I would maybe say, but here, but generally speaking, uh, Ron, the positives and the negatives are somewhat symmetrical. Uh, I, I'd probably say they look okay, but definitely you nailed it. Uh, we are definitely seeing splices, okay, uh, along the waveform. One here, here, and notice that as the TDR pulse travels and more is reflecting back, it gets weaker and weaker and weaker. So as we go down the cable, the reflections get weaker simply because of signal attenuation traveling. Okay. All right. And Medell, uh, an open on A, absolutely, the event right here. Now, again, that might be an intentional open. That might be the end termination of the cable, just simply parked, you know, uh, as an open, not connected to anything. All right. Take a look at the red waveform. What are we seeing in the red waveform? Go ahead, pop in your, or, yeah, pop into questions your answer to that question. Wow, that's confusing. Okay. What are we seeing on the red waveform? There you go, Rob. Excellent. Short of conductor or neutral? Uh, James, absolutely. Now, what's rather interesting, if this was, for instance, the same cable, then that would tell me that we have a fault after the second splice or the third splice failed and went to a short circuit condition. Very good on that analysis. All right, let's move on. All right, here we're going to take a, a look at a low voltage circuit, basically made up of three conductors, and this might be direct buried in the ground. So this might represent a basic 480 volt, 240 volt system made up of three random conductors forming the circuit. So we're going to use a TDR and we're going to measure different combinations of conductors. To use a TDR, you must have 
two conductive surfaces that are traveling in parallel with one another. Think of like a uh, train and railroad tracks. In order for the train to travel, it needs two tracks. In order for the TDR pulse to travel, it needs what's known as a transmission line. It needs two metallic surfaces in parallel with one another. Think of it as the rails of the uh, train track. The train is the pulse that's traveling down the rails and then when reflects, comes back in the opposite direction. So in order to use this TDR, we have to connect it across two conductor surfaces. In the process of interrogating this three conductor circuit, we're gonna first go ahead and connect the TDR across conductor one and conductor two. And it renders the waveform that we see here in blue. We are now gonna go ahead and connect the TDR between conductor two and conductor three. It renders the waveform that we see in red. And finally, we connect between conductor three and conductor one, and we get the trace that is shown in green. What have we just learned about this three conductor circuit based on these captured waveforms? Blue is when we connected between one and two. Red is when we connected between two and three. And green is when we connected between one and three. What are these three patterns telling us about this circuit? Give it a moment or so, but type your answer into the questions pane. Looks like kudos are gonna be going out to Ron. And Okay, possibly Rob, uh, conductors uh, one and two are longer than uh, the other conductors. That's a possibility, but I'm gonna rule it out when I explain why. And Thomas, again, major kudos both to you and Ron. Uh, there's an open conductor on the number three, uh, or if you want to call it ABC, there's an open conductor on C. Because notice that when we connected across one and two, we measured full length of the cable. Now, definitely we see an open reflection here. Uh, if I had made my measurement and everything, I could have proved that that is the end of the cable. So between conductors one and two, I measured full length. Now, what I measured between conductor two and three, I never saw the end event. It went away. It disappeared. Instead, I saw a large positive reflection indicating the point of an open, but at a distance significantly shorter. Now, if conductor three was shorter than uh, conductors one and two, yes, that could cause the problem. But more than likely, if conductor three is shorter, it must mean that there is an open circuit on conductor three. Now, this is further proven when we connect between three and one. Again, we measure relatively short but the only time we measure short distance is when conductor three is connected to. When we connect across one and two, we see total length. So kudos to Thomas and Ron, you solved the mystery there. All right, let's go into another one. Here again, three conductor circuit. We connect between conductor one and two. We clearly see an open. Let's say I take my measurement and it tells me proper cable length. So I'm looking at the end of an unterminated cable, okay? I connect between two and three, I get a duplicate pattern. 
I connect between three and one, and I get a new pattern. What are these TDR traces telling me about the circuit? Okay, Thomas, you're quick on the draw. There is a short circuit between conductors one and three. Ron, absolutely, we're dealing with a short circuit here. Okay, so when I measured between one and two, I saw to the end, two and three, everything looked good, I saw to the end. Only when I connect between three and one, I measure a large negative reflection indicating a short circuit. Excellent on the interpretations, Tom and Ron. And now I have a distance that I can measure to. All right, that is the beauty and benefits of a TDR. Once we get a little practice recognizing these waveforms, we're able to make measurements. Now, a little trick that you can also do as you're gaining familiarity with the TDR, let's say that I have a waveform like shown here. Even if I'm unsure of what these little S patterns represent, one of the nice things that you can always do with a TDR, and particularly if you have a one-line diagram, you have an event that you see. Place your marker and take a measurement. Now, look on your one line at X amount of feet. Is there something there? Is the cable going into a switch? Is the cable uh, you know, tapped onto uh, or going through a T-tap at that location? So even if you don't exactly know what the event image is, you can measure to it and then ask the question, what is there at X feet? If you can't come up with an explanation of what is there, but you clearly see an event, then that is a possible failure point that you're looking at. All right. Now, Let's assume that the, we're dealing with a low voltage cable, okay, uh, maybe uh, telecom cabling, uh, maybe signal control wiring, maybe low voltage 480 volt cable. I use the ohm meter. There is still about 600 ohms of resistance, greater than uh, the range of the TDR. So the TDR does not work here. It just shoots right past the fault. It does not show me enough of a negative reflection that I can recognize there being a partial short. The resistance of the insulation is too high. TDR pulse goes right by it. The resistive ratio bridge is the tool that I need for this application. Again, I do not want to put a thumper on a low voltage circuit. There's no good return path for the fault current, and I could cause horrible electrical hazard in the environment. As I told you the story about the uh, um, cable fault locator who killed a cow that was leaning up against one of the cattle fences by trying to thump onto a low voltage cable where there was not a concentric neutral for the uh, fault current to return on. So since the thumper is not an option, resistance is too high, in the insulation to use the TDR, the resistive ratio bridge is the tool that I need. Now, if you're familiar with basic resistive ratio bridges, there are Murray loops, Wheatstone bridges, Varley loops. They all sort of, kind of, all work the same. Basically, what we need is the good conductor and a faulted conductor. And basically, we jumper the end and we're performing some ratio measurements. Basically, what the bridge is determining for the good conductor is what is the longitudinal resistance from point A to point B. On the faulted, we're going to have current leaking and taking a parallel path. Therefore, we won't see the full longitudinal resistance. There will be a differential in there. And when we rebalance the bridge, it will give us a percentage of line length to where the fault took place. Now, whether it is a Varley loop, a Murray loop, or a Wheatstone bridge, they all sort of kind of do the same thing. 
Now, for the longest period of time, as wonderful as this tool was, there was a long period of time where I could not find a resistive ratio bridge anywhere in the market. It, it seemed like for whatever reason, they all dried up, went away, manufacturers uh, stopped making them. Well, I'm going to apologize, but I'm going to throw a little bit of a commercial out there for uh, Craig Goodwin at uh, High Voltage Diagnostics out of Atlanta, Georgia. They have a product now, I think it's been back on the market for about a year and a half, maybe two years. It's called the DigiBridge. It is a resistive ratio bridge. This product can be used safely and accurately on both low voltage and medium voltage cables for the purpose of fault locating, utilizing the ratio bridge technique. Awesome product. Once again, sorry for the commercial, but guess what rental company has it readily available in their inventory? If you answered ProTech, you would be correct. All right, enough with the commercial, but the resistive ratio bridge is back. Hoorah. All right, let's go on to medium voltage electrical power cables. What is our strategy for pre-locating on these devices? Now, we can potentially use the time domain reflectometer, but on a medium voltage cable, even faults that a lot of times you'll hear the technician say, oh, it's grounded, it's shorted, there's a solid short on there. And I'll say, okay, well, what was the megometer reading? 110K ohms. All right, if there's 110,000 ohms of insulation resistance, that is not, by definition, a dead short. I mean, from a 15 kV applicational uh, um, uh, viewpoint, yes, that's a crappy cable. Uh, you know, that 101K ohms of insulation resistance is not going to support the voltage. But, by standards of the low voltage TDR, that insulation resistance is still extremely high to the little 25 volt signal that you're sending in there. So the TDR pulse would just go right past the fault like it was never there. And all you would ever get is a reflection off the end of the cable. So how do we overcome this problem? I'm sorry, I keep bumping my mouse. Let me uh, get back onto the right slide. There we go. So how do we overcome this problem? Well, the answer is going to be a technique called arc reflection. Now, this technique basically incorporates all of the strength of the TDR, but it combines it with the high voltage capabilities of the thumper or capacitive discharge or surge generator. I'm going to use the term thumper because I think most people are more familiar with the term thumper than surge generator or cap discharge unit. Now, another technique, so we can either use the arc reflection or there's another pre-locating technique called the impulse current. Sometimes it's called the surge pulse reflection and yet other people call it the secondary pulse reflection. This uses a form of TDR, and it uses, again, the thumper to break down the fault and to create fault transients along the cable. So let's take a look at how both of these techniques work, arc reflection and impulse current. Let's see how they work. First thing we do is we use the TDR and we take a low voltage picture. So the TDR pulse travels right past the fault, never sees it, we get a reflection from the end of the cable. Let's watch that again. So the pulse is traveling, goes past the splice, goes right past the fault there, reflects off the end. I see the splice, I see the end of the cable, I don't see the fault. What I do now is I turn the thumper on. And with the thumper turned on, I surge the cable and I fire TDR pulses down. When the fault breaks down, 
an arc is going to be produced in the insulation at the point of the fault. At that moment of time that the arc is there, insulation resistance is going to go to zero ohms and the TDR pulse is going to bounce off of the arc, hence the name arc reflection. So the second TDR pattern that I pick up, the after thump pattern, let's wait for it, it'll be shown in red, shows me the short circuit at the flash point. Now, by utilizing one or two thumps in order to capture the radar pattern, I can now quickly measure the approximate distance to the fault and I can eliminate a lot of stressful thumping on the cable and my pre-location now works rather well. So all I had to do was unite the thumper with the TDR. Now, how do we do this? Well, when we take a thumper, a thumper is really nothing more than a big, large capacitor with a power supply attached to it. So the power supply charges up the capacitor, a switch closes, sending a surge of energy out along the cable. When that surge of energy reaches the weakened insulation or the gap uh, in the fault, the energy discharges through the gap, all the fault current travels back on the shield safely, and then is dissipated to earth ground through a discharge resistor inside the surge generator. Now, since this is sending high voltage surges, and the TDR is sending low uh, um, voltage, high frequency AC pulses, I need another piece of hardware. I need to use a low voltage device simultaneously with a high voltage device. So I need a power separation unit. Now, the thumper is sending a DC surge. It will travel through the inductor but the DC will be blocked by the capacitor, forcing it out onto the cable and to the fault. The TDR is sending high AC frequency pulses that will travel through the capacitor. They will be blocked by the conductor, forced out onto the cable. Perfect energy isolation. Now I can use low voltage and high voltage at the same time without blowing up the TDR. When the thumper sends the surge and causes the breakdown, for that moment of time, the impedance of the fault goes to zero ohms. The pulse reflects off the arc in a negative direction, indicating a momentary short circuit. I capture it and I can now see it on the radar screen. Now, there is yet another benefit of this technique. Under normal situation, when this switch closes, you would have a very sharp rising surge of energy launched into the cable. Since this energy now has to travel through this inductor, we have the inductance of the filter, we have the capacitance of the cable. That is going to establish this thing called an L for inductance, C for capacitance, LC charging cycle. So in essence, it reshapes the thumper's output surge. Instead of a very sharp rising, sharp transient, it now has to charge through this LC time constant, and we get more of an oscillatory rise of the surge voltage. Now, why is this significant? Well, let's say that the fault breaks down at 4 kV. And let's say that the operator sets the thumper to 30 kV. Now, surging it way over the limit of the cable could be stressful, right? Well, here's where the filter really steps in and reduces any negligible stress on the cable. So assuming that the thumper set to 30 kV, but the fault only needs 4 kV to break down, close the switch, boom, big 30 kV instantaneous surge, feeding through the inductor, 
it causes an oscillatory gradual rise to the uh, potential. When the potential reaches 4 kV, the fault flashes over, causing a short circuit. Once that short circuit is caused, the voltage clamps at that point because now the circuit transforms to a constant current circuit. But what do we do with that extra energy? Remember, we still had 30 kV worth of energy. Voltage now clamps at 4 kV. All of the remaining energy... Oh, got to stop bumping that stupid mouse. All of the remaining energy is taking up in a sustaining current. So the width of the pulse extends wider. So I can thump higher in voltage. The result is voltage is always going to clamp at the breakdown level, but the remaining energy is going to extend the period of time that the arc is resonant on the circuit. Now, this is important because when you're trying to get the TDR pulse there to bounce off the arc, there's a timing situation that needs to be worked out. For instance, if the TDR pulse comes, travels past the fault, and then it arcs, I missed it. I don't get an update. If the uh, arc flashes quickly and the TDR pulse hasn't reached it yet, I missed it. I don't see it. So when the filter is engaged, I can take advantage of this LC charging that's going to take place. So if I thump it at, let's say, 4 kV, I get a breakdown, but I don't get a good radar signal, I'll turn the voltage up. In reality, voltage is still going to clamp at the breakdown level. I'm not going to over voltage the circuit, but by turning the voltage up, when the voltage clamps, the arc is going to sustain longer, allowing my TDR better time to get its pulse out there, reflect, bounce back, and give me a proper update on my screen. So the filter serves many wonderful functionalities. Reduces stress by clamping voltage to only that that is required to break the circuit down. Extends the arc duration period, in many cases, long enough to successfully capture it with the TDR and give me a successful pre-locate. So, advantages of the technique. Any fault that I can get to arc over and I'm able to sustain that arc long enough to bounce a pulse off of it, I can find these faults very quickly. Even though I am using a thumper or a surge generator, I am not overstressing the cable, I'm not over thumping it, causing the cable uh, to possibly prematurely age faster. The number of surges that I'm using are greatly reduced because Let's face it, in reality, if I tested and analyzed everything properly and I've selected this technique, the chances are I'm going to have a TDR pattern within one, two, or three thumps. If it's taking me more than three thumps, if I'm into this for like a half a dozen thumps and I'm still not getting results, you know what? I'm going to stop. I'm going to shut the thumper down. And I'm going to go back to my test results. And I'm going to reassess what's going on. Because if I haven't found it yet in like six thumps in this technique, something's wrong. Don't just keep pounding. That doesn't produce results. Either A, I'm going to reassess my test results and maybe select the impulse current technique, which I'm about to talk about. Or I might change my vantage point. I might go to the other end of the cable and shoot back. Maybe the profile of the fault from end A into the fault was maybe a relatively high resistance. Maybe there was a lot of contamination or the distance between the neutral and the uh, conductor were large enough that it was causing a large breakdown delay. And maybe that's why I was getting the bad results with the arc reflection. I move to the load side of the circuit and I shoot back in. Maybe here, the distance between the conductor and the uh, shield are more reasonable, less contamination. And maybe on the first thump, boom, I get a beautiful radar tech, uh, picture. So again, if you don't render results, 
don't just sit there repeating failure after failure after failure after failure, praying uh, that situation changes. No, stop. Collect your thoughts. Have a beverage. Look things over. Move to the other end of the cable. Select a new technique. Now, the old output voltage uh, to the cable is automatically regulated by that filter. So I can put all of the voltage that the thumper is capable of producing. As long as it is surging through the filter, the filter will always clamp the voltage to just to that that the cable needs to break down. So I cannot over voltage the circuit. Clients will love that because you're not destroying their cables. Now, the limitations of this technique. Traces resulting from complex circuits can be very difficult to interpret. What I'm referring to there is if we're basically dealing with radial feeds, it's not too difficult to interpret the patterns. But if we are de dealing with like network cables, like in downtown Philadelphia, where there's branch circuits going all over the city, T-taps, Y-taps all over the place, TDR pulses are splitting and we're getting reflections all over the place. This can be very difficult to interpret. Now, many of the TDRs offer a technique called differential measurement. Now, the technique that I use here is I take the low voltage picture, I thump, take the high voltage picture. The TDR now has two waveforms. The internal computer is going to take all those data points and it's going to do subtraction cancel out everything that is common and only show the point of difference. So in theory, everything that precedes the fault should be identical, whether it was the low voltage trace or the trace with the thumper pulse on it. The only point of difference should be at the fault point. So I can take this complicated waveform through differential cancellation. I get a nice canceled out straight line. The first reflection marks location of fault. So even on a complex waveform, let the computer do some of the work. Use the differential technique, cancel out everything that's common, only show the points of interest. Okay, so use the differential. Now, cable faults like on paper insulated, lead covered, cable faults that might be uh, well saturated or underwater, like submarine cables, uh, or cable faults like in splices that have very long breakdown periods. We may find that to the best of our effort, we just cannot get a good arc reflection pattern. We cannot get the TDR pulse to bounce off the arc at the right time. If this is the case, we're not going to keep thumping and pounding away on the cable. What we're going to do is we're going to switch our radar technique and we're going to use the technique of impulse current reflection, which I'm going to show you in a moment. Also, the TDR has to be able to transmit a pulse the entire length of the cable and still have enough energy left in the reflection to make its way back to the TDR. So length of cable might be an issue for some TDRs. I remember doing some submarine cables at one time, and unfortunately, the lengths we were dealing with about 25 miles of cable. I never was able to see to the end of the circuit. So obviously, my TDR only had a limited view. The alternate technique that would overcome length issues and would overcome timing issues of getting the arc and the thump, at, or the TDR pulse and the thump aligned properly would be the surge pulse reflection or impulse current technique. In this technique, the thumper is going to send the surge. When it breaks down the cable, it's going to create current transients. Now, hopefully this picks up on the microphone and everything, but think of it as energy being dispersed into the system, okay? So my tabletop here is going to be the cable. I'm going to put a large amount of energy into this cable, okay? 
to put my little cell phone right here. So I put a lot of energy into this. Now, when all that energy is transferred onto the cable, a percussion wave is being established and it's oscillating along the cable, or excuse me, along the tabletop. Now, you might have seen the cell phone slightly vibrate, further emphasizing that there is an oscillatory pattern being created and that is how all this energy is being utilized in the form of work, okay? Now, in the electrical, when the fault breaks down, boom, current transients are going to shoot out of the fault and they're gonna oscillate on the cable, okay? Inside of the test equipment, there is going to be a high frequency CT, so these transients, as they're oscillating, have to go through the CT and will be picked up and shown on the screen of the analyzer. So the thumper charges the capacitor, closes the switch, the surge breaks down the fault, causing the transients, they pass through the CT, and we pick up the oscillatory pattern on the screen of the radar set. Now, depending upon whether the CT is connected to the conductor side or if it's connected to the shield side, they will either be positive spikes or they will be negative spikes. Now, proper marker placement. The very first surge, the very first spike that we see here, that is the thumper pulse passing the CT at time period one as it leaves the capacitor and travels down the cable. The second spike that we see is a result of the fault flashing over. Wait for it. Boom. Then that travels through the CT at time period number two. The, the reason why we don't want to use these two peaks is we don't know what the breakdown period is. It's going to be unique for every single fault. How long does it take to ionize, carbonize, draw an arc, and go to fault condition? So between the launch of the first thumper pulse and the return of the first transient after breakdown, this is an unknown time period. It's unreliable. We cannot use this for measurement. However, once the arc is established, here we have first return from the fault. Here is the reflection from the capacitor of the thumper. So we have fault, thumper, fault, thumper. Over here, we have fault, thumper, fault, thumper. As long as I measure between any of these consecutive peaks and I know the velocity of propagation, I have, in essence, calculated distance between my thumper and the fault. Now, advantage of this technique is there is nothing between the thumper and the fault. We got rid of the filter now. We don't need it because we're not making a direct connection with the radar. We're making a connection through the CT. So as long as I have a thumper that is capable of breaking down the fault, no matter how long the cable circuit is, if I can break it down, these transients are gonna be produced. These transients are gonna be produced as a function of the uh, surge voltage. So they're gonna be rather strong in nature. Length of cable is normally not a problem. I've done submarine cables up to 30 miles using this technique, and it works beautifully. The patterns agreeable are a little bit more difficult to interpret. What I would recommend to shorten the learning curves is even if you find the fault using arc reflection, which is a much easier pattern, before fault, after fault, negative reflection, boom, that marks the fault point. So even if you've used dark reflection successfully, when it comes time to pinpoint 
you're going to want to get that filter out of the equation because you don't want to regulate voltage anymore. You want all the energy of the thumper hitting that fault so it causes a good acoustic wave that you can hear on the surface of the ground. So while the guys are going out to do the pinpoint, put the radar into the impulse current or surge pulse reflection method, capture the waveform as you're thumping. Through practice, you already know where the distance is based on your arc reflection pattern. Now you can play with your markers to see where you get the appropriate distance. And you, as you're using the thumper to pinpoint, the person who's back at the equipment is capturing the impulse current waveforms, getting more exposure to them, more practice, and learning how to interpret them very accurately. Now, even on long cables, like I said, I've used these on submarine cables, uh, I mean, of tens of miles in length, and this technique works good. I needed a big thumper because I needed enough thumping energy to get out there 30 miles, but as long as I was able to break it down, this technique never let me down. I love it. All right. Of the limitations, the waveforms can be a little bit more difficult to interpret. There are some greater errors in the measurement distance, but again, let's put this into perspective. I am not looking to use this radar as a pinpointing tool. I'm going to let you know a little secret. Even if you used arc reflection, and at the risk of a lightning bolt coming through my window and zapping me, even if the Lord Almighty calibrated my equipment and took the measurement for me, I will not dig on that result. That is no slander against the Lord Almighty. See, no lightning bolt hit me. I'm still alive, okay? I, I'm not saying anything bad about the big man upstairs. What I am saying is, even if you had a measurement guaranteed perfect, the radar is measuring the conductor distance to the fault. Now, unless you're going to dig and trench and put your walking wheel on the conductor, because that's the only way you're going to correlate proper length, you're going to use a walking wheel. You're going to say, hmm, the cable drops down about two feet, rough estimate, advance your wheel, and then you're going to walk the surface distance. Surface distance might have gradient. Point is, the TDR could be perfect in accuracy, but your ability to measure to the fault is imperfect. So forget about the notion of a TDR being a pinpointing tool. It is only to get you really close to the fault very quickly. We're still going to use an alternate method for pinpointing. So to put this into perspective, on that 30 miles of cable that I did on that one submarine job, this technique put me within 200 feet. It eliminated 30 mile search down to a 200 foot sector. Did I accomplish something that day? Damn right I did. Now, once we had it down to that location, rather interesting story. How do you pinpoint on a submarine cable? You send down divers. The divers first have to go ahead and find the cable on the ocean floor. Cables are dropped with slack because the tides will drift them. Sediments will build on top of them. So you send down a dive team and they start looking for the cable. First identify the cable. If they don't identify the cable in a reasonable time period, now this is going to sound ludicrous to you guys, but this is what happens in the real world. You start sending in thumper pulses. The thumper pulse is obviously going to dishwash, or dishwash, discharge into the salt water. The divers will swim around until they feel a tingling on their suits. You can't make this crap up, okay? That will help them, or they look for the bubbles coming out of the ocean floor as the cable's flashing. 
Okay. Now, once they've now got an idea of where the cable is and possibly even seen the cable fault through the bubbling, the next part of the process of getting these pontoons and trying to raise the cable evenly so not to tear it apart is quite the fiasco in and itself. But again, point I'm trying to make, length of the circuit is not an issue. As long as you have a thumper power from enough to break the fault down, get enough energy to uh, where it needs to go and cause the breakdown, you'll get the patterns. This technique works wonderful. Even though you do get slightly greater errors, all things put into perspective, if I can eliminate 30 miles of searching and only get it down to 200 feet, heck yeah, that's a good day's work. Okay, hampered when used on circuits with sheath gaps and cross bonding. Remember earlier when I talked about the cross bonding or any sheath gap where we interrupt the sheath and it's basically opened? No TDR technique will go beyond an open gap. No TDR technique will work on a cross bond. It'll only take you up to the point of cross bond. Now, if on those wind farms that use cross bonding, if they're brought up into a junction box, get some jumper cables, jumper across, and keep A neutral going to A neutral, B neutral going to B neutral, C neutral going to C neutral. Basically, defeat the cross bond. The TDR pulse will now travel down. All right, let's talk about the selection of a thumper. There are a variety of thumpers in the marketplace. There are big ones, there are small ones, there are short ones, there are tall ones. Putting it into proper perspective, picking out a thumper is kind of like picking out a hammer. You've got hammers that are designed for light work, uh, small tacks, uh, finishing nails. You've got large hammers, mini sledgehammers and everything for driving in spikes uh, or railroad spikes or whatever, okay? Thumpers are similar in nature. One of the ways that we rate a thumper is, one, how much voltage is it capable of producing? Again, voltage is going to be important because if a fault breaks down at 10 kV, thumping it with a thumper that only puts out 8 kV is worthless unless we burn the fault down to the point where it breaks over at the 8 kV or the value that the thumper is capable of producing. So another uh, big rating on a thumper is its energy. How much energy can it put into the circuit? Energy is what's going to be needed in order to drive out the contaminants, get a good strong thump, a good strong arc, and also to overcome attenuation and dispersion as the energy travels down the cable. So you need basically fuel in the gas tank to travel far distances, energy. The way we calculate energy in a thumper is the size of the thumper capacitor, divide by two, multiplied by your applied voltage squared. C divided by two times V squared. Now, in this slide here, the red line represents the typical breakdown characteristics of a fault gap. In order to break down a gap, you need a minimum level of voltage. How much voltage does it take before this breaks over? Also, you need a minimum breakdown time period. If there's any type of contamination or anything in here, how long upon reaching the breakdown voltage how long does it take for it to ionize, carbonize, track, and arc? So the voltage has to be present for a minimum time in order to cause that to happen. Now, if we would plot that out, we would come out with a curve similar to this. Now here in thumper example A, I use a thumper that has lots of voltage and lots of energy. I will exceed the minimum breakdown voltage. Also, there's enough energy that as it travels the length of the cable, the arc is present long enough 
uh, to break the cable down or to get the arc to form. And where I intersect the line here, this shows that I have a successful breakdown. This thumper worked perfectly. Now, in example B, my thumper had plenty of voltage, but the capacitor was very, very small. Now, it might have been this little 50-pound wonder called the fault wizard with very low energy capability. So even though it had enough voltage to potentially break it down, as that voltage traveled along the cable, due to the low energy, the signal dissipated and attenuated. It, by the time it reached the cable fault, there wasn't enough energy or remaining voltage to cause breakdown. That thumper failed me. It didn't do the job. Again, if you want to put another analogy, if I'm going moose hunting, okay, and I take a BB gun, the BB gun probably won't even go ahead and penetrate through the fur of the moose. He won't even know you're there, even though you're shooting him, okay? It's not effective. You need a proper caliber. In Thumper Pulse C, we had enough voltage, enough capacitance and energy so we were able to sustain that voltage, the distance it traveled, it broke down the fault, we got a successful flashover. So selecting a thumper for the job is important. If you're going out on, uh, again, I'm gonna keep using that uh, um, analogy of the wind farms because I've noticed a lot of people get themselves in trouble on the wind farms. Um, they'll go and they'll want to go ahead and rent the cheapest, 50 pound battery operated wonder. So they take this little 300 joule unit out to a collector feeder of eight miles in length, and then they're upset because it doesn't work. Sorry, you, you took a BB gun to try to hunt a moose. It ain't gonna work, even with good shot placement. Now, Warning, cable length, a cable is a big capacitor. The longer the cable length, the more capacitance you have. So cable length and fault flashover parameters can be a contributing factor to damage or a safety hazard when using this equipment. In this scenario, let's say again, I'm on eight miles of cable and I'm using a thumper with a small low end capacitor into it. I'm thumping into the circuit, but based on where the cable fault is, it's not breaking down on every thump or it's not breaking down at all. So I send the first thump in, no breakdown occurs. What happens to the energy? It sits on the cable. I charge the capacitor again, I send another surge in. It doesn't break down. What happens to the energy? It's sitting and stacking on the first surge. I thump a third time, fourth time, fifth time, sixth time. I keep stacking and charging the capacitance of the cable. Now, your thumper is a large capacitor. Your cable is a large capacitor. One of these capacitors is stronger than the other. One of these capacitors is going to fail. If the cable capacitance is stronger, it's going to reach a voltage level, and it's basically going to thump back to your thumper and blow your capacitor to kingdom come. Why do I know this? Well, back in 1985, I was demonstrating a big, heavy-duty, state-of-the-art thumper to Georgia Power. At insult to injury, this um, thumper <laughs> was in a panel van, and we're sitting inside the van, and I'm thumping into this cable, and I'm a new pup. I'm, I'm still in my learning curve. Um, I'm thumping, and it's not breaking down this cable fault. Got to about the ninth thump 
and the cable one, it backfed into the van, into the thumper in the van. Thank God the cabinetry and everything uh, of the thumper and the chassis, you know, did what it was designed. It sustained the arc internal, but this was a big oil filled capacitor in this particular one. So on the seams of the uh, chassis, there was oil that kind of seeped. There was a big flash inside the van. The sound wave, I mean, our ears were ringing. A couple of us walked out of the van, immediately took a beeline to the Porta Johns and cleaned ourselves. So take it from me, I've lived it firsthand where the cable won and the thumper lost. A lot of my intelligence comes through making a lot of mistakes and learning from them. Now, if the fault does not flash over during each discharge from the surge generator, either due to the fault conditions, the capacitive loading, or the distance that you're dealing with, stop, reassess the situation. Maybe moving to the other end and shooting back might be the course of action because what was far away might now be close, okay? Also, you might do what they call a uh, fault conditioning technique. Thumpers are capable of what they call a burn down mode. So you raise voltage until the cable flashes over. You don't trip the circuit. You now feed current into the circuit, sustain the arc and cause a burning down of the insulation at the fault point. We can condition the fault where maybe now we can lower the fault resistance to where we can get it to break over successfully on each discharge. Point is, stop thumping. If it's not working, stop. Okay. Again, I got lucky that particular day because sitting inside that van, if that chassis would have blown, um, threw oil on us, or if that chassis would have gone hot, I could have killed myself or killed somebody in that van. And not to mention the amount of damage that I did to the thumper, okay? Um, but again, in that scenario, the people were more important than the darn thumper was. But case in point, I did not look at what the equipment was telling me. I pushed it and like in the old uh, Bob or uh, um, Eric Clapton, I fought the law and the law won. Or was that Bob Marley? Whoever. Um, in that particular case, the cable won. Uh, those of you on the question, who originated the song, I Shot the Sheriff? Was that Bob Marley or was that uh, Eric Clapton? Type it into the question pane because now I'm curious. All right, let's move on. So we've either used the arc reflection technique and we successfully located the fault, or we went ahead and used the impulse current technique and we successfully located the fault. Now comes the critical moment. Again, I remember in one uh, scenario, I was on that submarine cable of 30 miles in length. And again, I'm kind of a new kid on the block, you know, just learning all of this stuff. And uh, I remember when we went ahead and got it on radar, uh, I measured the location and I was like all happy. I said, yes, we found it. And my crew leader, my supervisor looked at me, he goes, oh God, Tom, we haven't found nothing. The work is now only beginning. Now we gotta find the cable and we gotta go ahead and pinpoint the location before we can surface the uh, cable. He goes, finding it on the radar, Good boy, you helped out, but we haven't found nothing yet. You haven't found anything until you got it pinpointed. So that's what we're going to talk about next. Now, one other point though that I do want to make about these TDR patterns. Guys, this is a lot of information to consume in one sitting. Come Monday morning, if you get called out on a cable fault, do I expect you to be an expert and necessarily know how to use this properly? I'd be very surprised. I mean, kudos to you if you're, if you're able to take in that much information and in such a short period of time, absorb it, comprehend it, and apply it. If you are out on a job site, and I'll post uh, and make sure that you have uh, my contact information, 
and particularly if your phone has FaceTime capability, call me. I've been doing this for about 37 years now. I can talk you through on the phone what to do. If you've got FaceTime and you can actually show me the screen of the analyzer, I'll tell you exactly where to place the markers, what to do, and, you know, so through teamwork, we'll get your learning curve to where it needs to be. But call. Don't just sit there banging away on the circuit, getting frustrated. That doesn't help anybody. All right. We're going to go ahead and take our afternoon break. When we come back, I've got a short video uh, that kind of shows a demonstration of the arc reflection technique. Um, after that video, then we're going to go in and talk about how to do the pinpoint. Hello and welcome to another Shermco University Tech Brief. I'm Tom Sandry. In this episode, we will learn how to perform a cable fault locate using the Mega PFL 40 system and the arc reflection technique. Here is the rear panel of the PFL 40 system. Let's go through the basic connections together. Connect the earth ground cable to the ground lug on the rear panel of the PFL 40. Connect the earth ground cable to the utility ground or ground bus. The high voltage output cable plugs into the rear panel of the PFL 40. Plug the high voltage output cable in only after a good earth connection has been established. Here is the end of the high voltage test leads. The circuit end of the high voltage leads offer removable test lead adapters. With the connectors attached, connect the high voltage test lead, red, to the conductor of the cable under test and the surge return lead, black, to the cable's concentric neutral or tape shield. Once all the connections are made to the cable under test, connect the safety interlock plug into the PFL40. Removal of this safety interlock disables the high voltage output of the PFL40. And finally, connect the power cord to the PFL40 only after all high voltage connections and grounding has been done safely. Let's now focus on the front panel of the PFL40 and go through the sequence of setups in order to run the arc reflection test. So we power up the unit and the instrument will display the firmware revision. It is not too uncommon you may get the message excessive earth resistance. If you are sure that you have a good earth ground established utilizing the utility ground or a driven ground rod at the job site, you can ignore this message and say continue and then disable the ground interlock. You'll notice the controls of the PFL40's high voltage system. You can use your up-down keys to adjust your flashing marker to the different test settings. For today's demonstration, we're going to perform arc reflection. So with the cursor flashing at arc reflection, we push down on the activate key to activate that setting. The PFL40 provides us three ranges of test voltage, 0 to 8,000 volts, 0 to 16,000 volts, and 0 to 34,000 volts. For today's demonstration, we're going to use the 0 to 8,000 volt range. Now that the high voltage controls are set for arc reflection and the 0 to 8,000 foot range, it is now time to turn on the time domain reflectometer. The time domain reflectometer is an embedded PC and operates with an embedded Windows operating system. So you will notice that it does go through a very similar boot up sequence as your notebook PC. You'll notice that when it booted up, it started automatically testing and sequencing through its different operating ranges looking for the end of the cable under test. Now here it's telling us that the end of the cable is at 406 feet indicate it by this positive reflection right here. If you want to test to make sure that the PFL40 did this auto sequence successfully, have a technician go to the far end of the cable and apply a ground. Adjust your controls using your rotating knob to the test function and push down on your rotating knob. The time domain reflectometer is now in a real-time capture mode. When the technician goes to the far end of the cable and applies a ground, we should see the positive indicating an open circuit turn to a negative indicating a short circuit. Now that we have validated that we're looking at the true end of the cable, we can cancel the test function 
and continue on to the arc reflection capture. In the arc reflection capture, we're going to discharge a high voltage surge of energy onto the cable to break down the fault and to force an arc at the fault. We're going to select the arm position and we're going to arm the time domain reflectometer. Now the unit is waiting for a high voltage event to occur. Going back to our thumper controls, we're going to use the voltage control knob and we're going to slowly bring up voltage. Now if we want to increase the rate, we can use the voltage control rate by pushing down on this button while rotating the voltage control knob. We're going to start with a test voltage or thump voltage of about 5,000 volts. Once we have the thumper set up in voltage, we push the activate key. The unit will charge and discharge and the time domain reflectometer will capture the high voltage arc that had occurred during that thump. It will be re represented as a negative reflection indicating a momentary short circuit caused by the arc. We can now select the cursor to make a measurement to where this event took place. Here we show that the arc took place at 208 feet from our connection point. As you can see, the technique is easy to perform. If you do not obtain a successful breakdown and reflection as shown in this demonstration, try raising the output thumping voltage of the PFL40 until successful breakdown is accomplished. I'm Tom Sandry. Thank you. Okay, the one thing I will correct from that video is if you do not get a successful breakdown and arc reflection pattern, yes, by all means, try on the next thump sequence to raise the voltage a little bit more. Because again, if we're thumping through that filter, increasing the voltage may translate into extending the arc just long enough to uh, successfully get a TDR. Uh, signal to bounce off of it. If you are more than uh, six to seven thumps into this and you're still not getting results, stop. Reassess the situation. You might need to do some fault conditioning or you may need to switch over to the impulse current technique. All right, let's move on to the wonderful world of pinpointing. Once again, there are pinpointing techniques that we would use on medium voltage there are pinpointing techniques that we would use on low voltage. Starting with the low voltage cables, okay? These again can be uh, um, the signal control, buried telecommunication cables, or they could be low voltage electrical power cables. Um, one of the best techniques for finding, particularly, this technique works ideally if it's direct buried cable buried directly in the ground, not going through conduit uh, or duct back. If it is direct buried, there is a technique called the voltage gradient technique, which is phenomenal for this type of application. And it is designed specifically for direct buried low voltage cable circuits. If you are in conduit um, where you're isolated from earth, the low frequency tone tracing technique also can be applied, uh, although you have to be very careful of what locator tracer you're using. You don't want real high frequencies. If you're down in the like the 303 hertz frequency band, which a lot of the Dynatels offer, that would be really good for this application of tone tracing. The earth gradient technique, basically the way it works is you have a transmitter unit you connect the transmitter to the faulted conductor and to a driven ground rod. You are now going to pump current down the conductor. The far end of the cable needs to be left open because we want current to find its way back to the ground rod through the fault. So as we're pumping current, far end is isolated as an open, the current leaks through the fault into the earth traveling back to the ground rod. That creates a voltage gradient on the surface. Using a polarized set of probes or an A-frame, if we precede the fault, we'll get a positive kick. If we go beyond, we'll show a reversal in the current. 
and if we're directly standing over, we will get a null in the field. I believe the next uh, slide shows an actual demonstration that I liberated from YouTube, but this is one of the products that we do rent here at ProTech. Uh, it is the Dynatel model 2275, if memory serves correct. So let's go ahead and watch this video. This chapter will provide the basic principles and a guide to fault locating with the 3M Dynatel 2273 MID cable, pipe, and fault locator. The 2273 MID fault locator will find earth return faults. An earth return fault is one in which an insulated conductor is physically making contact to the dirt due to some damage that has occurred to the insulation of that conductor. When fault locating, the first step is to isolate both ends of the faulted section of cable. There should be no physical connection on either end of the cable. When fault locating, the transmitter is connected to one end of the faulted conductor. It sends a signal through the good portion of the conductor. When the signal encounters a fault, the signal returns through the dirt back to the ground rod and through the black lead of the transmitter to complete the circuit. Fault locating is pinpointing the spot at which the transmitted signal leaves the conductor and re-enters the ground. When the transmitted fault signal reaches the fault, the signal radiates from that point creating a pool of signal around the fault. This pool of signal is referred to as the area of detection. A pool of signal exactly equal to the signal pool around the fault exists at the ground rod. The areas are exactly the same size. The size of these pools is determined by the soil conditions and the severity of the fault. To measure the severity of the fault on this conductor, First, ensure that both ends of the faulted conductor are open or isolated from any connection. Connect the red lead of the transmitter to the faulted conductor. Place the ground rod behind the transmitter in line with the suspected path of the conductor. Connect the black lead of the transmitter to the ground rod. Check the battery level of the transmitter by holding down the off key. Press the second button on the transmitter, which is the ohm key. A flag will light in the display above the ohm icon, indicating that the transmitter is in ohms mode. A resistance measurement will appear on the display. The lower the resistance of the fault locating circuit, the more severe the damage is to the insulation of the conductor. If OL appears on the display, this is an indication of an open line. This indicates that there is not an earth return fault on this conductor. Press the second button on the transmitter again to place the transmitter in fault mode. A flag will appear in the top portion of the display below the fault locating icon and two locating frequencies, 577 and 33 kilohertz, will flash alternately on the display. We will address the advantage of these locating frequencies later in this video. Connect the 3 foot A-frame cable to the A-frame, making sure the cable is completely seated. Then, plug the A-frame cable into the receiver. It connects to the bottom of the receiver through the quarter inch jack. When the spike points of the A-frame are pressed into the ground, the A-frame becomes a two-dimensional sensor that will detect the fault. The receiver will calculate whether the green banded leg or the red banded leg is closer to the fault. Turn the receiver on by pressing the power key. From the main locate screen, press the command key below the word fault to place the receiver in fault locating mode. The receiver will immediately begin a momentary calibration mode, preparing to fault locate. It doesn't matter whether the A-frame is in the ground or not at this point. When the calibration is complete, step back toward the ground rod. Measure about one A-frame distance to the right or left of the ground rod. Step slightly in front of the ground rod and push the A-frame into the soil with the green leg toward the fault. This is the point where you are going to record a reference reading of the fault signal. The numerical value that is displayed on the receiver screen is a number that you should remember. For convenience, you can save this reading by pressing the first yellow command button on the receiver labeled Reference. The reference signal level at the ground rod will appear in the box above this key. Previously, we discussed that the fault pools created around the fault and the ground rod were equal in size. They are also equal in signal strength. When you have pinpointed the fault on the conductor, the signal strength at the fault will be within 12 dB or 12 points of the reference signal you measured at the ground rod. With the A-frame still inserted at the reference point, 
you will notice on the receiver that an arrow fills the screen toward the green band on the right side of the receiver. This is the indication that the fault is closer to the green leg of the A-frame than to the red leg. Move the A-frame forward toward the green leg. Insert it into the ground again. Let the signal settle on the screen, then move the A-frame toward the red or green leg indicated by the receiver. It is not necessary to probe the ground every few feet. Divide the section into pieces and continue probing the ground until the arrow reverses. The receiver now points toward the red band on the left side of the screen, indicating that the red leg is now closer to the fault. Probe the ground back and forth until the fault is centered between the red and green legs of the A-frame. You have now located the fault two-dimensionally. You have centered the A-frame over the fault in the forward and backward position. Now you need to pinpoint the fault in a left-right direction. Turn the A-frame 90 degrees over the center point that you have just pinpointed. Watch the receiver screen for an indication whether the red or green leg is closer to the fault. Probe the ground moving left or right toward the red or green indication on the receiver until the arrows reverse again. Center the A-frame over the fault. Place your toe on the ground at the center point between the two legs of the A-frame. Turn the A-frame 90 degrees one more time to verify the forward and backward location of the fault. When the arrows on the receiver screen balance, the fault is under the center of the A-frame. Verify the fault location by placing the red banded spike into the pinpointed fault location. Insert the green leg into the ground randomly in a 360 degree circle around the fault point. Watch the receiver screen. Every time the green leg is inserted into the ground, the arrow on the receiver will point toward the red band on the left side of the screen, indicating that the red leg is always closer to the fault than the green. After the fault has been found, Move the A-frame about one frame width away from the fault and insert into the ground with the green leg toward the fault. Note the signal level on the receiver screen. If this is the only fault on the line, or the most severe fault on the line, the numerical signal strength on the receiver screen will measure within 12 dB of the reference reading you took at the ground rod. This reference reading is in the bottom left corner of the screen labeled Reference. If this signal level does not fall within 12 dB of the reference reading, there may be multiple faults on this line. Sometimes, you will be fault locating on very long sections or in very bad soil conditions, and the fault signal pools may not overlap each other across the entire section of cable. You must be within one of these pools in order for your equipment to detect the direction to the fault. For example, you have a section of cable that is 100 feet long. There is a break in the insulation of this cable, causing an earth return fault at 55 feet. It is very likely that the areas of detection, or pools, will overlap on this short section of cable. You would never know that you have passed from one area of detection to the other. But, if your section of cable is 2,000 feet long, and the fault is at 1,500 feet, the fault signal pools, or areas of detection, may not overlap. There may be a portion of the cable that is only carrying the fault signal. If this is the case, you may find that the receiver will seem to be confused in the middle of the section or not give you a strong indication of red or green. This only means that you have walked out of one of the fault signal pools and have not yet entered the second. This poolless area is sometimes called a dead zone. For example, if you lose fault indications 500 feet away from the transmitter, you have entered the dead zone. This dead zone will continue until you are within 500 feet of the fault. Then you will begin detecting the fault again because you have entered the fault pool. The transmitter sends two locating frequencies, 577 and 33 kilohertz, simultaneously with the fault locating signal. These locating frequencies can help you get through the dead zone and stay on the cable path until you get closer to the fault or walk back into the second fault pool. To switch the receiver into cable locate mode from the fault locating mode, press the locate button, then the yellow button under cable pipe. It is not necessary to unplug the A-frame while in the cable locate mode. The cable locate screen will appear. Set the frequency of the receiver to 577 or 33 kilohertz by pressing the yellow key labeled frequency until 577 or 33K appears. 
Typically, 33 kilohertz will be the locating frequency you will use because of the high resistance of the fault and soil conditions. Press locate to acknowledge the frequency setting and enter the locating screen. It is easy to switch back to fault locating by pressing the locate button and pressing the yellow button under fault. Probe the ground with the A-frame to see if you have re-entered the second fault signal pool. If you have, you will see a steady red or green indication on the receiver's screen. Continue following the indications from the receiver and the A-frame until the fault has been pinpointed as stated earlier in this chapter. This concludes the section Fault Locating with the 3M Dynatel 2273 MID Cable Pipe and Fault Locator. Okay, that is a tremendous tool. Now, we talked about it in the context of using it on low voltage cables that we cannot thump on, okay, that are direct buried in the ground. Another great application of that same tool, if this was a medium voltage cable, and let's say that we want to test to make sure that the jacket has not been damaged during the trenching and the installation. We could modify the circuit hookup. We could take the same tool that we just watched in the video, connect it to the metallic shield, concentric neutral, whatever you want to call that outer metal uh, layer, and a driven ground rod. Leave the remote and terminate it open. Pump current down the metallic shield, if there is damage to the jacket, it will enter the earth, return to the ground rod, create the two pools that uh, the gentleman in the video described, and the same technique can be used to find jacket damage on medium voltage cables. It is an awesome, this will provide. awesome, awesome tool. I don't leave and I don't do uh, an acceptance test at a wind farm without having that with me. Because not only do I want to validate that the cable has been installed without any uh, um, issues that are going to affect its performance, but as my last check, I want to make sure that there's been no jacket damage that is going to allow water and moisture to get into the cable and cause premature failures within the first two years. All right. Now, let's say that the cable is not direct buried in the ground. Let's say that the cable possibly is in conduit, isolated from ground. Obviously, the earth gradient technique is not going to work because there's no current entering into the earth. It's entering into the pipe. We can use a tone tracing method. Now, most tone tracers, when we feed current down the conductor, as current travels down a conductor, a magnetic field is going to radiate around the conductor, okay? Those of you that had electronic uh, or electrical theory, the right hand, left hand rules, you know, if you hold the conductor with the left hand with your thumb pointing in the direction of the current flow, your fingers indicate the direction of the magnetic field as being radiated. Yay. Good old theory. All right, so as current is pumping down this conductor, a magnetic field is radiating around. If the receiver is in the peak capture mode, when the antenna is directly over the target, the maximum amount of magnetic field is passing through the antenna and we get our strongest signal indication. In this scenario, about 860 is our maximum signal strength. Now, with the far end of the cable terminated in an open, not landed and not grounded, okay, any of the signal leakage is going to go through the fault into earth, causing a reduction in current traveling the rest of the segue down the cable. So as I'm tra tracing in tone mode, I'm watching my signal strength numbers. Upon reaching a drop in my number, I stop and back up to where I receive that drop. What I do now is there's two situations that could cause the signal to drop. Either the cable went farther underground, meaning that now the magnetic field is farther away from you, or there is a fault 
and the signal is leaving the cable into the uh, duct bank. If the duct bank is flooded with water, this technique works really, really well. If the duct bank is dry, there will be no leakage, you will pass right over the fault. And again, the service complaint might be, hey, whenever it's raining or the ducts get wet, the lights start flickering, the lights are dim, indicating there is an insulation failure, but in a dry duct bank, you're not gonna find it. This technique will work well for you, but hopefully the duct bank is wet when you get there. All right. Let's move on to the world of medium voltage cables, okay? For medium voltage cables, probably the number one go-to tool is going to be the thumper. Again, the concept of the thumper is you charge the capacitor, discharge it, it breaks down the fault, causing a discharge of energy. That energy travels up to the surface of the ground, and acoustically you hear it as thump. Thump, thump, hence the name thumper. Now, if it is an arcing fault, if it is a fault that flashes over, this technique works very, very well. Depending upon soil conditions, audible signals travel farthest in wet soil. Dry soil, they don't travel and radiate as far, okay? So again, depending upon where you're at, if you're on the east coast of uh, the United States, where it's that good, moist, wet clay, you might be 10, 15, 20 feet from the fault, and you can hear it thumping beautifully. If you're in Odessa, Texas, West Texas, where I guess by the most technical definition of earth, you know, the ground that they put out there is considered soil, but it is so dry uh, that the sound waves barely travel at all you might be six inches from the fault and still have a hard time hearing the sound wave because it's not traveling very far. We will talk about accessory tools to help you in these situations. The other point I wanna make about thumping is thumping only works if there's an air gap. There has to be a gap between the conductor and the metallic shield. As long as you have an air gap, you can produce sound take away the gap, so for instance, a dead bolted fault, metal touching metal, you can get the biggest, baddest, nastiest, gnarliest thumper ever created and no sound to be produced. Back in the days before the arc reflection technique was launched into the market, one of the most fun things that we did during demonstrations when we would go out and, and promote the new technology was You'd go to a utility, uh, you know, Baltimore Gas and Electric, Mr. Brian Krepesh, love that man. He thought he was going to throw me a zinger. All right, kid, I've got a fault for you. We'll see if your newfangled whiz toy can find it. We've been on this cable numerous times. We're never able to find the fault. Let's see what your newfangled technology can do. So I would go ahead, I hook up the unit, put it into the uh, TDR mode. I turned to him, I said, uh, the problem is, is that you have a short circuit at 350 feet. Brian spits out his coffee, what? I said, here, and I explained the TDR technology and how a short circuit creates a negative, and here's the pattern, here it is. I said, and the reason why you never found it was you were using a thumper. No sound being produced, son, or gentleman, because I was the young pup, he was the old man. Um, Again, there's where having the backup with the TDR, if it is a bolted fault, short circuit, the TDR shows you the location. Thumping is not gonna be your choice for pinpointing because no sound will be produced, okay? In order to produce sound, we need air, we need a gap. So again, the thumper, we charge the capacitor, close the switch, boom, we discharge across the gap, that causes a uh, sound wave which travels to the surface and we listen on the surface of the ground. Now, when this switch closes, 
the surge of energy traveling, when the fault occurs, fault current is coming back on the shield, back into the instrument. So when the fault occurs, all fault current returns to the instrument via the shield. Current will be traveling on the shield during the fault. We can use a technique called electromagnetic tracking or ballistic tracking. One of the test sets, and again, there's different models out there, but one of the test sets is the Aquatronics SDAD. We'll wait for the instrument to come up here again. Now, on this unit, notice these LEDs. When the fault current travels back, it gets a maximum signal strength, saying that you are in front of the fault. As you go beyond the fault, all the fault current is coming back to the source. Little is carrying over. So if you notice on this graphic, when we get to the second manhole, we get virtually no bars. Let's wait for it. Watch here. Thump, little to no bars. Now, remember at the beginning of the training, I said, ask some questions before rushing out. Is it direct buried or is it in duck bank? If it is in duck bank, my job as a fault locator just got tremendously easier because all I need to do now is localize it using the arc reflection or impulse current technique, getting an approximate location. I am not going to bust and dig through the road, okay? So using the ballistic tracking, all I need to do now is locate the manhole that precedes my distance to fault and goes beyond my distance to fault. I set the SDAD receiver, on the surface above the uh, first manhole. If I get a deflection, that tells me I'm in front of the fault. If I go to the next manhole back and I get no detection, that tells me that the faulted section is between those two manholes. Now my job is cut, cut, pull, and replace. So my strategy changes on the pinpoint. All I need to do is sectionalize. Now, let's say though that we do have a direct buried cable. In a direct buried cable, excuse me, had to put my phone on silent, somebody's pinging me. In a direct buried, I can use the technique of electromagnetic and acoustic. Now here, these probes have geophones that pick up sound. When I thump the cable, the surge of current coming back triggers the receiver, showing me a deflection of the current, telling me that I'm in front of the fault, and then it measures the time differential from when the red probe measures sound, and then the time elapsed between capturing the current and when the green probe captures sound. And it will then light up an LED showing which geophone is closer to the fault. In this case, the red geophone is closer to the fault which is flashing right beyond it. Now, by moving the probes, if I go beyond the fault, the green lamp will indicate saying that, nope, now the fault is closer to the green probe. And just like in the voltage gradient technique, I adjust the probes until both the red and green illuminate indicating that I am standing directly over the fault. Now, this technique is fantastic because if the ground conditions are such that I can't hear it with my ear, or in my case, I went to far too many Metallica concerts and um, Ozzy Osbourne concerts as a young man that my hearing is really, really bad. So I'm not reliant on my ears, I let the probes do the talking and guide me straight in. Also, if there is a lot of rocks in the area, sound waves as they travel might pick up on a rock or a tree root, and they may oscillate along up toward the surface. So off cable path, I'm hearing the fault over here. That may lead me to a mist dig. This technique is not prone to uh, mishaps due to echoes. So again, we use the electromagnetic tracking, 
following that fault current. We then use the time differential between picking up the current and then picking up the sound, and we move in the direction of the sound. Very accurate. If you're going out on a fault locate, particularly on a direct buried, this is an absolute positive must-have accessory. And here's a little demo of it. Once you set your ballistic impulse to about a 50% deflection when you're up near the equipment, that is your base reference. Do not adjust sensitivity from that point forward. Now you can quickly start walking the cable path. As long as you're in front of the fault, the deflections should stay constant. When you see a drop in the ballistic impulse level, plug your geophones in and turn on your microphones. Make sure that both channel A and channel B are turned on. Now set your probes in the ground. It's closer to the green probe. Still favoring the green. Both lamps illuminate. He's standing over it. An absolute must have on any direct berry job. All right. Now let's talk about some special conditions. If we're on a medium voltage cable and we are looking for jacket problems, the earth gradient and the tone tracing that we talked about earlier works very well. The only difference is the transmitter gets connected to the metallic shield. We pump current down the shield. Current enters into the earth through the bad jacket. We establish a voltage gradient. We then use the polarized frame on the surface of the ground in order to probe to the current pool and pinpoint the jacket failure. Again, if you're doing commissioning at the wind farms, VLFing the cable, maybe doing partial discharge testing on the cable, do yourself a favor, do your client a favor, do a uh, um, jacket uh, or non-metallic sheath fault locate as well. Make sure that no damage happened to the outer jacket. If the jacket is damaged, moisture will get in and it will cause premature failures to their circuits. All right, into the wrap up here of this module. We talked about the different techniques. We talked about some of the different instrumentation for both low voltage and medium voltage. Let's put it all together into a strategy. First, what type of cable are you dealing with? What is the age of the cable? What type of insulation does the cable have? What is the conductor size, the circuit length? What type of bonding is being used? Again, we know cross bonding does not like the TDR techniques. What is the cable formation? That also is important because again, if we have a faulted phase, if it is in a flat lay, there is little risk of damage to an adjacent cable conductor because on a flat lay, we have conductor, conductor, conductor. If we thump and one breaks down, sparks over, 
it entering into the adjacent phase and causing a fault on the adjacent phase is greatly reduced because they're laid out in a flat and separated. If it is in that trifoil uh, where they're basically stacked on top of one another, this is good to know and I may carry some extra splice kits with me because when the fault on one phase happened, it might have blown into the adjacent phase causing significant stress to the second phase and I might have to replace all three splices when I go out on the job site. So asking the question of cable formation definitely helps me prepare and go properly equipped to the job site. Are there splices in the cable? If there are, there is a very good chance that the splice is what failed and the cable is good. And again, we want to make sure that we have appropriate splice kits. Do we know the location of the splices? Again, many of the wind farms, when they direct bury the cable, they will put uh, ball markers in at the splice pit locations. Again, 3M sells a ball marker location tool that we can go out and identify where the ball markers are. Other wind farms will give you GPS coordinates to where the splice locations are or the splice pits are. But again, if the fault is in at a splice pit, being able to identify where the splice pit is obviously is going to be needed in order to find the fault, unearth the uh, splice, and replace it. Do we know the cable path? It is worthless to just start walking and listening for a thump or walking and uh, going into a direction of whatever footage if we have no idea which direction to walk. So do we know the cable path? If we do not know the cable path, we definitely want to make sure that we have a good cable locator and tracer when we leave the shop because we may need to trace cable path. We want to diagnose the problem. Do not show up, hook up a thumper, and start pounding on the cable. That is foolish and it's going to waste a tremendous amount of time. You don't even know what you're dealing with yet. So confirm that there is a fault. Again, in the 37 years that I've been doing this, there's been numerous times I went out there, I tested the cable, the cable was fine. The fault was in at the transformer. That's why the circuit tripped. Had nothing to do with the darn cable. Now, if I had just hooked up a thumper and started pounding, I could have risked backfeeding and blowing up my equipment. I could have risked actually creating a fault in a cable where there was no fault to begin with, bottom line, I would have wasted a whole lot of time, stressed out myself, stressed out my client, simply because I didn't take the time to figure out what was going on. Don't just hook up a thumper and start pounding. Do some testing. Learn what you're dealing with. Do an insulation resistance test. How much insulation resistance is there? Do a high pod test. What is the dielectric strength? Does it break down? If it does, what voltage does it break down at? That's going to tell you where to set your thumper. Do the continuity test. If you don't get continuity, well, the TDR, you're looking for an open circuit. You don't even need a thumper at that point to find an open. Once we've done the precondition, or once we've gone ahead and tested the cable and got the profile, I might need to precondition. Let's say that the uh, fault resistance is still relatively high, and I want to reduce the resistance so that the thumper is capable of breaking it down on a continual cycle. Uh, I may go ahead and opt to use either the VLF. If you're familiar with the HVA VLFs, you can have it set to trip on arc or you can set it to burn. Basically, in burn, when you reach the breakdown voltage, it will not trip the test set. It will then feed current to the fault, causing the electrical tree to grow, reducing the contamination in the spark gap, and getting the resistance of the fault lower. Once I've conditioned it, one, 
I've driven the impurities out of the fault. So if there was an excessive amount of moisture and contamination, which was hampering my thumping, by doing the preconditioning and the burn, that current driving through the fault dried out the channel, carbonized the walls really well so that it'll spark and arc more regularly and give me more consistent thumping. So my success of finding it with the radar will greatly improve. Again, if I just hook up a thumper and start pounding, I may have bad contaminated conditions and all I'm doing is beating up a poor cable that doesn't need to be beat up. Okay. Do your pre testing. Learn what you're dealing with. If you have to condition it, the thumpers have a DC burn mode on them. If that's all you have, it'll work fine. It's just going to take a little bit longer to get it to condition properly. If you've got the HVA VLF, set it instead of trip on arc, set it to burn. Typically within a minute or two, uh, you will have a beautiful fault channel. She'll thump gorgeous for you. And it will take a ton of stress off of you, particularly when the customer is looking over your shoulder saying, have you found it yet? Have you found it yet? Have you found it yet? Once we've got the fault conditioned where we know she's going to thump and break over nice and clean, we now select our pre-location method, possibly the arc reflection. This is the one that's preferred by most people because it's so easy to identify. One of these pictures is different from the other. First picture, I see a splice. Second picture, I see an arc. Hmm, I wonder where the fault is. Place it at the negative reflection, get your distance. Once we now have distance, we trace the cable path and we select a pinpointing technique. In low voltage, I would typically use the voltage gradient. In medium and thumping situations, I'll use the electromagnetic and acoustic tracking and pinpointing. Now we unearth, we confirm, we repair. After we repair, we retest. Why do I retest? If there is multiple faults in the cable, the one with the lowest resistance is gonna be the one you're gonna find first. There may be a second fault in the cable. Again, it doesn't happen regularly, but in my 37 years, there's been at least a dozen times where literally I located the first fault, I retested after we spliced in, and sure enough, there was a second failure in the cable that had a higher impedance to it, which is why it didn't show up initially. He who has the lowest impedance breaks down first. Until I clear that fault, I can't find the second fault. And that concludes the low and medium voltage cable fault locating portion of the presentation. All right, before we move on to the cable fault profiling, I'm going to go ahead and attempt to unmute everybody's microphone. So let me go ahead and attempt to do this. Unmute all. Okay, that didn't seem to unmute all. So you're, hey, Matt, Tom, you're, you're unmuting you're unmuting them to where they can unmute themselves. They're not blocking. Oh, okay. Hey, there we go. All right. So everybody has the capability of unmuting themselves. So let's open it up to uh, some general discussion up to this point. Does anybody have any questions or areas of concern or areas of technology that they want me to recap? <laughs> I have a question. Yes, who is that? This is Joseph. Okay, what's your question, Joseph? My question is when you are uh, fault locating using the technique you showed earlier with the two probes, um, well, honestly, any really couple of those techniques you showed, what, is, what are the ideal conditions? Maybe the better question is, what are the not so ideal questions to perform those techniques in? Like what sort of conditions in your environment when you're trying to fault locate 
makes it virtually impossible or just very difficult okay. to use those techniques. I'll tell you, the early part of my career where I predominantly worked in the Northeast, I was getting to the point where fault locating was no longer fun. It was just so easy. I mean, anybody could do it, but the ground conditions were always fantastic. We always had that moist Pennsylvania clay and everything like that. So sound waves would radiate travel beautifully. I never needed fancy electronic pickup devices. I mean, you'd hear it thumping loud as can be, uh, you know, because those moist ground, the sound waves travel really, really well. Worst case scenario, I would take a parking lot cone, place it on the ground, and that'd be enough amplification I'd hear the thump. Where life really turned miserable was when I moved to Texas, and particularly West Texas. That dry, barren, sandy type of what they call soil out there, it is horrible. Sound waves do not radiate travel very well at all. So where in the past I was never really dependent upon using things like the electromagnetic tracking or the uh, acoustic amplification methods, anytime I would be going out to West Texas and particularly on those wind farms and everything, I learned very quickly, don't leave home without the uh, electro uh, without the electromagnetic uh, acoustic pinpointing set. There are some cases like uh, in Midland uh, on some of the wind farms there. Literally, we are right on top of the fault. The are killing me. I am straddling it. It is directly under me. And I might even feel a little bit of the oscillation on my boot. So I know I'm on it. I can actually feel the thump on my boot. And I still cannot hear the fault, even with the microphone, unless I crank it up to the highest volume setting. That's how poorly these sound waves travel in some of those conditions. Now, the one wind farm that I think might be in Risa territory, uh, there's one out in California uh, around the Baja area. You may even know which one I'm talking about because it's notorious that there are these uh, um, environmentalists that have cameras and they're surveying and videotaping all activity on this wind farm. I remember going out on that one one year and the ground conditions again were just so horrific that even with the SDAD, that Aquatronics SDAD, we didn't even pick up, the ballistic tracking worked great. So we were so reliant upon watching that ballistic tracking to where we got signal drop, we knew we were close to it. But even there, probing in the ground, we literally had to be within about 12 inches of the actual fault until the acoustic detectors were able to pick up enough acoustic to point in either direction. So I guess the big, big caution area is it is actually the drier the ground, the harder the job's going to be on the pinpointing and the greater dependency there's going to be to using those electronic devices. Wet, moist ground, you're going to find the job goes really, really quick and easy. Um, the other is having the wrong size thumper. I've gotten into a situation once or twice where, you know, the unfortunate is you've got to take what's available to you. And I did go out on um, a couple jobs where the thumper theoretically had all of the voltage I needed. And this was, again, during my learning curve when I really started getting involved with, uh, you know, collector feeder cables, particularly those that were greater than, you know, one or two miles. Like the first time I got out on one that was around 15 and 20 miles in length, I had a thumper that had plenty of voltage but the maximum output joules energy that it can transmit was only in and around 800 joules. Now, in my past experience, you know, using it on like residential loop circuit, short cable runs of, you know, less than a mile, this thumper never let me down. It always worked beautifully. Well, using it on this really long cable run, I got into a situation where I'm thumping, 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 
the needles on the thumper are sort of indicating that I'm breaking down the circuit, but I'm not getting any good radar patterns, uh, you know, or I'm thumping and it's showing me that it's not breaking down. I thump, but I did not get an indication of breakdown. That's where I learned very quickly about you need the voltage, but you also need the energy so that it can travel the long distances and still have enough voltage and energy when it reaches the fault to cause the breakdown. Now, I got lucky on a couple of those jobs. I just simply, when I couldn't render good results from end day, I stopped, grabbed a cup of coffee, loaded up the equipment, drove it to the other end, shot back in. I got lucky. From the far end, I was close enough to the fault that I now noticed that she was breaking down on every cycle. I was able to find the fault much, much easier. So the fancy equipment, the worse the ground conditions, the more dependent you're going to be on those pinpointing tools. Okay, The wetter the ground, the easier the job is going to flow. When you're out going out on those collector feeder cables, try to figure out what the length. If you are dealing with eight miles and longer, you want a thumper that is going to be able to produce at least 1,500 joules. Ideally, a 2,000 joule thumper would be my choice. If you don't have a thumper of that size, you might get lucky. If you're close enough to the fault, if it's close enough to where you have the equipment hooked up, you might have a successful locate. But you're now using hope as your strategy. I would never go out on a wind farm as my choice on a collector feeder greater than eight miles with anything less than a 2,000 joule thumper. If it's the only thing available, the only thing I can get my hands on is one of the lower energy ones. Look, I'm going to take it. I'm going to try to get the job done for the client. Uh, but I know I'm already going in handicapped. I don't have the right tool, the perfect tool. Did that help answer your question? Um, kind of. You uh, definitely gave me a better understanding on what makes it better or worse. Um, I wanted to just share real quick, if we got a second, um, what my experience was. Um, so the example I was, I, I only have mainly just one time I had the experience of trying to fault locate. It was my first time and only time. Um, and the location was in a mountainous, it wasn't a wind farm. It was just a, um, I forget the exact, uh, what they were doing, but it was a very mountainous terrain. Um, they gave me the general cable direction, but there was no exact uh, layout of the cable and the terrain varied in elevation. So who knows what depth it was at different spots. Um, the terrain varied from rocky to being very sandy to be very clay, <laughs> that's the word. And uh, it was just watching their videos that you showed and they're on this perfect flat grass and, <laughs> and um, I was like oh man like and watch it, watching this kind of affirm that I don't believe I was doing it wrong because I was learning it as I was doing it as my first right. time and uh, I had a fellow co-worker co with me as well and he was learning it too he was on the uh, the thumper uh, while I was trying to locate it and uh with that experience in mind, uh, that's why I asked that question is because, and yeah. on top of that, it started raining. And I know we had the electromagnetic um, pinpointers, and I believe I found a spot, but all I could hear was raindrops, and there was really no way I could confirm uh, yeah. where I was, down. at what depth. It was just insane. So I guess wow. I was asking that question to sort of confirm that we were really not in ideal conditions to try to fall locate. I just wanted yeah. affirmation, I guess. A couple of techniques that you could have done, um, and, and again, experience is our greater teacher. Uh, you know, going out there the first time, some of these extra ideas may not have come to us uh, during that particular uh, um, outing. But one of the things that you could have done, uh, like you said, it, it's in a mountainous area. 
the gradient is changing, so the depth to surface of the cable itself may be changing, which pulls the signals either closer or farther from us. One of the things that you know um, I would have possibly uh, recommended is first start with the cable locator tracer, because like you said, they told you general direction, but you didn't really have cable path. With a good locator tracer, as you started going, you would have referenced your signal strength number. So whatever that is, say 700 was the number. As you're tracing along the path, if the number were to change by 12 count or better, either A, stop back up to where you get back to 700, take a depth measurement, move forward to where you get the dropout, and take a depth measurement. Did the depth change? At that point, I would have put a little spray paint or a little marking down saying, okay, I'm on the same cable path, but the signal strength numbers got weaker due to depth change. Then I would have continued my tracing. Uh, if the cable came back up to the surface closer, I would have got an increase to my signal strength number. Again, I would take measurements to verifying depth. But most of these tracers, you place it directly on the ground, you hit the button that says depth, and it'll report back its estimated uh, depth to the cable conductor. So that would have been one thing that could have helped a little bit on that particular day, marking the areas where we know the cable is getting farther away from us. Now, as far as the non, um, um, I always mispronounce this word, but uh, homogeneous uh, soil conditions, where it's like sandy, rocky, clayey, if that's a word, that one's going to be a little bit more difficult uh, to go ahead and predict on the surface uh, of the ground. Depth, we could have done that through route tracing, and at least now we know the accurate route. Uh, definitely. Having the uh, the product like the electromagnetic acoustic detector could have been uh, a bit of a help for us where in the situation when the raindrops started coming down, I've been in that situation or the other one that's a real nightmare. You're in a residential neighborhood and there's three kids playing basketball and you're trying to listen for the thump through the uh, amplifiers and all you're hearing is that damn basketball bouncing on the ground. Things that you could have done there is when you thought you might have been hearing the actual thump, radio back to the guy at the thumper, say, hey, I think I hear you, but the problem is I'm getting a lot of raindrops. Uh, so do me a favor, change the thump interval to every six seconds. Now try to go ahead and count. Uh, a lot of times what I'll do at this point is I'll have that electromagnetic detector, that ballistic detector, I'll lay it on the ground over the, uh, over the uh, fault pad. And every time I see the deflection in the LEDs, I'm trying with my ear, am I hearing a thump at the same time? When I think I hear it, I'll have the, my guy at the thumper change the fault sequence, change it to seven seconds or eight seconds. If again, I get the deflection every eight seconds and I hear the sound every eight seconds, I have much higher confidence that I'm on the fault point. But the situation that you were in where you have non-harmonious uh, soil conditions, gradient can be changing uh, and everything on you, they're just going to make for a very challenging day. Uh, I think you were doing everything right. Again, knowing the cable path, marking areas of depth change, and using that electromagnetic uh, to verify, okay, thumper pulse just happened, did I hear a sound, might have made the day go a little bit easier. Any other questions? Okay, overall feedback. Did I cover the material? Did we learn something today in the different techniques and how to use them? Does anybody have any comment? No, it was very good. Long, long day, but very good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Long day, and particularly sitting in front of a computer monitor. It's bad enough you're in a classroom, but at least if we're all staring at one another, cracking jokes, the day goes a little bit easier. So, I, you know, major, you know, kudos, you guys who are fantastic uh, hanging in there 
you know, with this computer broadcast and everything. So appreciate. All right. Let's move into the fault profiling. Um, and in all honesty, I think we're going to wind up, uh, you know, ending early today. Uh, I did kind of overpad, you know, for eight hours. I wasn't sure if we were going to need it, but I didn't know how many people were going to be on. And I really didn't know the depth of conversations that we were going to get into. But we have one more module that I do want to kind of cover called fault profiling and how to read the instruments to help determine what we're dealing with. Because um, obviously, the better we profile the fault, the better we can select the right tools. So bear with me. I'm going to queue up the last training module. Okay, the last training module is, again, uh, a troubleshooting guide, cable fault profiles. Now, I will say, depending upon the thumpers that you use, these fault locating guides may be helpful. On some of the thumpers that you have access to these days, these guides aren't really going to help much because the equipment like a lot of test and measurement equipment nowadays is trying to use um, AI, artificial intelligence. It's trying to become smarter and do more of the work process for you. Now, although this is a good thing in a lot of situations, when they start removing the analog meters for like the voltage and the current, I personally don't like that. I like watching the metal, metal I like watching the needle movement. That tells me a lot about what's happening in the circuit. When I've successfully broken down a fault, what I expect to see is the voltmeter kicks backwards and the amp meter drives forward. So when I see those meters fluctuating in that nature, I know I'm getting a good breakdown, I'm getting a good thump. Hard breakdown in voltage, in rush of current as the fault current flows through. Some of these smarter thumping units that get rid of those meters, I have no tactical feedback that I'm getting good breakdowns. Now in those situations, if the unit is equipped with that impulse current or surge pulse reflection technique, I will use it to determine if I'm getting good breakdowns. If I thump and I get that seismic tornado pattern, I know I'm flashing the cable and I'm breaking it down good. If I don't get that pattern, I know I didn't break the cable down. So I thumped into it, but nothing happened. It did not break down. Those situations, like I said, you've got to be careful because the more you thump into it, if it doesn't break down, you've got the cable capacitance in competition with your thumper capacitance. You charge the cable up enough, it may thump back into your thumper. And trust me, I learned that the hard way. That was one of the scariest moments I've ever had when that thumper capacitor inside the van blew. It was terrifying. Uh, you know, I can laugh about it now because, you know, it's, you know, almost 30 years ago in the past that that happened. But I tell you, that was a big learning moment in my career. All right, let's move into cable profiling. So a cable fault can be defined as any defect, inconsistency, a weakness, or a non-homogeneous, you know, non-harmonious, however you pronounce that big fancy word. I'm from Jersey. I can't pronounce it. Okay. But any other weakness that affects the performance of a cable. All faults in underground cables are different, and the success of a cable fault location depends to a great extent on practical aspects and the experience of the operator. It is important to understand uh, testing techniques and the ability to diagnose uh, test results. It is equally important for trained personnel to be thoroughly familiar with the fundamentals of power cable designs, operation, and maintenance. All right. 
even with proper equipment and experience, cable fault locating can still present challenges. These challenges are minimized significantly by the understanding of the equipment, the techniques that are available to us, and most importantly, stick to a disciplined step-by-step -step procedure. Fight the uh, desire to take shortcuts. Stick to a regimented procedure. And typically, even in the worst scenarios, it'll keep you on path. I'm not gonna say it's gonna make an easy day, but a lot of times if you skip steps, you might have missed something, and then you're down on a wild uh, goose chase, wasting a lot of time, stressing yourself, stressing the cable. Stick to a regimented discipline of step-by-step -step procedure. Now, most uh, cable fault locating failures and wasted time normally is attributed to misinterpreting the test results, selecting the wrong tool for the job, I'm either using an underrated thumper, um, I did not bring the pinpointing equipment with me, or I took shortcuts in the process. Education and experience will correct and improve the, the results interpretation, but only discipline is going to you know, correct the wasted time as a result of not asking the right questions before leaving for the job, taking the wrong equipment to the job, or trying to take shortcuts. All right, shorter conductors or bolted faults, okay? This is where the insulation resistance, in essence, is practically zero ohms. And I'm not talking zero ohms as from the perspective of a megometer, okay? If I'm measuring close to zero ohms, but I'm applying 5,000 volts to it, that's one condition. If I really wanna know how the TDR is going to perform, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll connect an ohm meter across the conductor and the shield. If I'm measuring several hundred ohms with an ohm meter, because again, your standard ohm meter is putting in about the same voltage levels as a TDR, a few tenths of volts, okay? If there is about 400 ohms or greater of insulation resistance as seen with an ohm meter, the TDR by itself probably will not find that fault. It'll just shoot right past it. All you'll see is the end of the cable. However, if we know this to be the condition, we can still possibly use the arc reflection technique. Again, at 5,000 volt megometer reading, maybe I'm measuring close to zero or only one or two ohms. But I know that if I thump it at at least 5 kV, she should flash over relatively easily for me. Now, when I thump, if the unit still has the good old analog meters and the manufacturer didn't take those away from you, when you thump and you get a good breakdown, volts should drop almost to zero. And you should see a good distinctive forward kick in your ammeter, indicating the inrush of fault current back on the shield. So what you're looking for is a good kick in the ammeter, a good drop in the voltmeter. Also, depending upon the thumpers that you use, I've always been partial to the mega thumpers. One, because I used to work for the company and I had a lot of on time using them. But the other reason I always liked them is they use a, a gravity drop switch. So when the uh, capacitor is charging, the solenoid creates a magnetic field, holds the switch in the open position. When the capacitor is charged and it's ready to discharge, it breaks the magnetic field and you just get a drop of the switch, discharges the energy out into the cable. What I've noticed is if it is a good solid breakdown, one, I see the good kick on my meter. Second, the tonal quality of the switch drop. If I hear a clunk, 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 a good deep bass sound to it, I'm getting a good discharge. If I hear more of a tin can reaction to the switch drop, clink, clink, it's not breaking down hard. I'm not gonna get good arc reflection uh, results. Now, how did I learn that? through repetition, through a lot of use, and a lot of familiarity with that particular tool. 
I really, you know, noticing how it performed in different situations, I learned the you know, secrecies associated with that tool. Now, if I got a thumper from the Bond Corporation or I got a thumper from Hypertronics, it may not respond in the same manner. If it has the analog meters, though, hard kick of the ammeter, hard drop of the voltmeter on any thumper that has analog meters normally indicates good arcing condition, good strong arcs. The sound of the switch, if you got the mega thumpers, you want to hear that clunk clunk and not the tink tink sound. On the cable analyzer, if it is a bolted fault, 400 ohms or lower as measured with an ohm meter, the TDR should give you a clear, distinct negative reflection and you never see to the end of the cable. Now, the challenge is going to be pinpointing because remember what I said about a thumper. If there's no air gap, there's no sound. So in this situation, you've located the fault with the TDR, the big negative reflection, but you can thump it till the cows come home, you're gonna produce very little to no sound. Now, you might get lucky if you're in good hard clay conditions. Every time you surge, it may cause a secondary impulse into the clay, maybe, maybe with an acoustic pickup set, you might be able to hear it on the surface, but don't count on it. You're just getting lucky at that point. What I would do for the pinpoint in this situation is I would measure distance to the fall from end A. I would take the TDR, go to the other end, shoot back, measure distance, and I'm gonna bracket out the fault location. If the measurements fall too far apart, I'm gonna increase, bring the measurements in closer. If they overlap too much, I'm gonna decrease the velocity, bring the measurements in closer, and I'm gonna mark that area for my dig. I'm going to have to land the plane without acoustics. So the other is you could use the ballistic. The sound wave is going to be very weak because there's no gap. However, you're creating a big inrush of current straight through a dead short. So the electromagnetic tracking, the ballistic tracking, a few inches in front of the fault, you should get a good strong deflection on the LEDs. As soon as you go, Beyond the fault a few inches, you should get a huge dropout because you have no breakdown time constant. There's no ionization, carbonization. It's just a full inrush current through the short. So the drop off in ballistics should be relatively sharp. So measure from both ends, bracket, and then look for the sharp dropout in the electromagnetic tracking. That should get you to a good dig point. All right, a compound fault, a blowout. Here's where the fault took such an inrush of current, it literally blew the conductor in half. Now, the problem that you run across with this is, let's say that end A is the source, and B is the load side. When the cable blows apart, all the fault current is going back to the source. A lot of times what happens is the gap on the source side of the circuit becomes enlarged. Either the conductor burns back into the shield or we go ahead and burn back enough of the metallic shield that this gap is very, very large. Now again, when you high pot it, it's going to measure the leakage current from the conductor to the metallic shield. So when you high pot it, you might find that the leakage current exceeds the trip point of your DC high pot, and you get a false indication that, oh, the fault breaks down at 5 kV. However, when you're doing the uh, thumping or arc reflection technique, you are reliant on not leakage current, but you are reliant upon jumping an arc between the conductor and the shield. So the gap distance becomes important because leakage current may show up and trip the unit at a lower voltage, 
but in order to overcome the gap and get an arc to jump that gap, you might have to go much higher in voltage, okay? Now, this is where, again, watch those meters. If you get a weak drop in voltage and a sluggish kick forward in amp meter, that's a bad breakdown. It discharged some of the energy, but it didn't flash hard. Probably you're going to get crappy radar results. In those situations, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll go to the line side of the circuit. Now, let's jump ahead a second. The TDR pattern, if it isn't open, right, I'm going to either, when I thump, I'm going to get a slight decrease in the amplitude of the open, or if I'm getting a good breakdown, when I thump, there's going to be an arc across the open, and the positive is going to invert fully to a negative. This indicates a strong thumping condition. Pinpointing is going to be relatively easy. If I thump and I just get a little bit of an amplitude change, that means it's a weak thump, and pinpointing is going to be harder because I'm not going to be producing a lot of sound. In this situation, I may opt to go to the line side, thump back into it. If I see the positive invert to a full negative, I know I got a strong arc and acoustic pinpointing is going to be much easier for me. Again, on the meters, if I see a weak kick forward on the amp, weak kick back on the voltmeter, again, conditions may not be good from the source side. The distance between the conductor and shield may be too excessive. Moving to the line side may definitely render better results. Splice faults. In a splice fault, let's face it, there's a lot of material that you're thumping through. Your gap distances are going to be extremely large. Splices are designed to blow out at the end of a splice. So your channel may be very elongated. It may take a lot of thumping voltage and energy to break down this gap. Option A is to do the conditioning. Use the VLF burn mode, burn a better channel, get it good and carbonized, get out any contamination, and see if that gives you a better thump condition. Again, things that you're looking for is a strong kick forward in the ammeter and a strong kick back in the voltmeter. That will indicate that she's now thumping well. If you discharge and you get a weak drop in voltage and a really weak kick forward in the ammeter, you still have a lot of resistance in the gap. It's not flashing and breaking down solidly. Now, if the arc reflection technique is hampered, like let's say I'm looking at the pattern. Here's the splice in blue before thump. After thump, all I see is a slight drop in the uh, positive and a slight decrease in the negative. That may be an indication to me that she is breaking down at the splice, but she's not breaking down hard. It's a weak breakdown. Pinpointing is going to be very, very difficult at that point. Now, either I can do conditioning, try to burn the channel down, get the contamination out, re-thump. If the plus minus uh, sine wave during the thump turns into a full negative reflection, now I know that I've got a good solid arc, a good solid thump. Pinpointing is going to go a lot easier for me. Now, if arc reflection fails, okay, let's say arc reflection fails because I cannot get a strong enough arc to bounce the uh, TDR pulse off of. In this situation, I have found that the impulse current technique is superior. Although that filter is really nice because it regulates the amount of voltage, et cetera, et cetera, everything we talked about. If that filter, if that inductor is choking back the necessary energy that I need to cause that splice to flash over hard, then I got to get rid of it. If I use the impulse current technique, there is nothing standing between the thumper capacitor and the fault. 
all voltage and all energy that that thumper is capable of producing is going straight to the fault. Now in this situation, that may be a benefit, but I'm gonna get that shock wave pattern. I'm gonna have to learn how to interpret it, measure from peak to peak. That'll tell me the distance between me and failure point. Again, if you're ever in this situation and you haven't had the time to practice and experience, at the very end, I'm gonna give you all my contact information. I'm available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I will say though, if you call me on the cell phones, particularly uh, you know, like after business hours, I get a lot of spams. So if I don't pick up, it doesn't mean that I'm not available. Simply if I don't pick up, I don't recognize the number, or a lot of times when the number comes in from a company, like it comes in from Risa, sometimes it'll just show up on my thing and say, 602, blah, 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 uh, spam likely, okay? Because it's coming in from a company. They don't know if it's a salesman or if it's a technician in need. So a lot of times I will leave the first phone call, go to voicemail. Don't be offended. You know, I get so many calls in the course of a day and the majority of them, unfortunately, are telemarketers. If it goes to voicemail, just simply say, hey, this is John with Risa. I'm on a cable fault. I can really use some assistance. I'm going to play back the voice message immediately. Now that I know that you're not a spammer, I'm going to call you right back and we're going to get this job done. OK, again, 24-7, 365. I never once, though, said courteous. Call me up at three o'clock in the morning, disturb a good sound sleep. You will get help, but I might be a little bit grouchy, okay? Just putting that disclaimer out there. All right, the pinhole. What, what about bailing me out? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I actually did that with a technician once at uh, um, <clears throat> Shermco. <laughs> I literally got a call. He was, uh, um, oh my goodness, he was at uh, um, a power test conference, and I guess they went to a pool hall, got in a little bit of a disturbance, and yeah, at 2.30 in the morning, I went to bail him out. Oh my Lord. But, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're in this business long enough, and particularly with the personality of some of us field guys, yeah, bail bonds, uh, phone numbers on speed dial sometimes, uh, you know, uh, are <laughs> just as important as carrying the right equipment. <laughs> right. Yes, it is. <laughs> oh, Lord. Now, these pinhole type falls, electrical trees that um, fault in the cable, I'll be honest with you, these are normally really easy to find. Uh, Typically, the breakover uh, characteristics uh, on these, they will break down at relatively moderate to low voltage levels, snap over clean. You know, these type of pinholes or electrical tree faults normally are very easy to find. The only thing that will make these difficult is your ground conditions. Locating with the TDR normally goes very quickly. Locating with arc reflection normally goes very, very easily. The pinpointing gets challenging like in the one discussion where it's that mountainous, uh, the cable depths are changing, it's non-harmonious soil conditions, um, or anytime I go out to West Texas, uh, I know the locate, pre-locate's gonna go easy, pinpoint is gonna be rough just because that ground is terrible out there. Sound waves just simply do not travel in that bloody ground. But again, we're looking for Good strong kick in the ammeter, good drop in the voltmeter. I know I've got a good arc going, and I get the beautiful textbook negative reflection that flashes after the thump. And typically, it only takes about two, three thumps to get an excellent radar pattern. All right, that concludes today's session.